Test. Thank you very much. I, I would ask you to take your seats so that we can begin the agenda. And I will first ask our Chairperson of Council to say a few words. Thank you. Th thank you. Thank you, everybody. I, I want Gunila to introduce the, the thematic panel, and uh, then I will share it. Thank you. Well, dear delegates, dear observer here at the FAO and online from all over the world, it is once again time to focus on the thematic discussion on climate change and natural disasters. Culture cannot wait. Uh, today we will, uh, as previously announced, have a panel with invited speakers from uh, member states and delegations uh, uh, and also from uh, some of our observers. I will soon hand over to our moderator, Madame Lavandier, who will do this with pleasure and efficiency. Uh, but before I do so, I would like to thank for all the interesting comments I have had about the keynote speech given by Mr. Velasquez, who we also see here once again, welcome, uh, and that he made two days ago. His message, message has uh, really started discussions and reflections, both about climate change and cultural heritage, but also about the need for cooperation and to create synergy between global organizations. Friends, it is time to close your computers, stop texting, and join us in the coming discussion become, because it is in real life and climate change is happening in real life. Marie. The floor is yours, <laughs> as always. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want really to, to thank a lot uh, Gunilla Landeslo for all the work she has done with uh, the working group, uh, pardon, avec le groupe de travail uh, consacré uh, à la préparation de cette discussion thématique à laquelle nous étions particulièrement attachés. Et j'aimerais uh, remercier, présente à la tribune, membre de ce groupe de travail, uh, notre collègue du conseil, Eglal El Malik. Euh, je vais aller très vite sur cette introduction. Euh, Gunila a été très claire sur le sujet. Euh, changement climatique, euh, la culture ne peut pas attendre. C'est le thème de cette session. Et la culture ne peut pas attendre. Euh, C'est une façon euh, de dire à l'Assemblée euh, générale... Euh, Qu'est-ce que nous pouvons faire euh, Nous, euh, représentants des États membres, euh, nous, représentants euh, des professionnels du patrimoine, que pouvons-nous faire, et à l'échelle locale et à l'échelle globale Le changement climatique, euh, c'est une chose à laquelle euh, chacun d'entre nous est confronté dans sa vie quotidienne, euh, chaque jour. Euh, C'est un, une donnée qui est reconnue aujourd'hui euh, de manière universelle, avec en particulier cette euh, grosse réunion internationale euh, qui se prépare à Paris et qui ouvrira dorénavant dans neuf jours exactement. Euh, le changement climatique, on l'a dit, se transcrit à la fois par des changements quotidiens, imperceptibles, mais impactants et qui peuvent euh, donner lieu in fine euh, à des changements majeurs et il se traduit par des catastrophes euh, euh, considérables. Dans les deux cas, euh, le patrimoine est comme nous, il est impacté directement. Et ce que nous avons voulu faire euh, au niveau de l'organisation de cette table ronde, c'est effectivement nous interroger à la fois sur les approches euh, globales, euh, internationales, mettant en œuvre à la fois euh, des approches euh, documenter et prioriser concernant le patrimoine, mais aussi des approches plus euh, globales euh, qui s'imposent pour que les aspects patrimoniaux soient inscrits euh, davantage dans les agendas et les plans de prévention des risques à l'échelle mondiale. Euh, 
Mais nous avons aussi voulu euh, voir avec vous, euh, avec des études de cas issues des pays membres, euh, comment au quotidien euh, nous pouvons euh, préparer euh, cette, euh, cette lutte contre les effets du changement climatique euh, sur notre patrimoine. J'aimerais dire... Euh, deux choses. D'abord, se préparer, ça implique un certain courage. C'est le courage de choisir ce que nous voulons sauver et ce que nous voulons sauver en premier. Euh, la deuxième chose que j'aimerais dire, c'est que euh, le, le, un des films qui nous a été projeté hier euh, présentait un moment extrêmement émouvant où une femme disait euh, « Nous sommes très pauvres et euh, la seule chose que nous avons à léguer à nos enfants, c'est ce que nous allons sauver euh, aujourd'hui. Voilà, j'aimerais engager la discussion euh, sur, cette, euh, sur cette, la table ronde, sur cet euh, envoi. Euh, nous allons tout d'abord euh, avoir le plaisir d'entendre M. Rohit Djiziazou, qui est euh, président, Rohit, vous êtes euh, euh, président de l'ICORP, euh, Incomos International Scientific Committee on Risk Preparedness. Euh, vous êtes euh, actuellement euh, UNESCO Chair Professor euh, à euh, l'université, excuse me, à l'université Ritsumeikan euh, à Kyoto au Japon et vous, vous allez nous présenter euh, les, les approches euh, globales et leurs nécessités en cours de réflexion concernant cette inscription du patrimoine, patrimoine de tout type, bâti, mobilier, ne l'oublions pas, immatériel certainement, euh, dans cette euh, euh, lutte d'ensemble qui est en train de se euh, reformuler à l'échelle mondiale. Roïd, vous avez la parole. First of all, I'm very pleased to be here and thank uh, the council members and all the organizers for inviting me over here. So what I'm going to speak about is uh, institutional and policy frameworks for climate change, disaster risk reduction, and cultural heritage management. What are the gaps and what are the opportunities that exist? Uh, we all know about uh, how cultural heritage is being impacted by increasing climatic hazards. Uh, we have floods in Balkans last year, which damaged many, many historic uh, towns uh, in the region. We also are very much aware of floods in uh, Thailand in 2011, because of which many sites, including World Heritage Site of Ayutthaya, was damaged not just because of heavy rains, but because just the amount of water in limited, um, uh, limited time was just not enough to be uh, drained out. And the site just got uh, damaged because the wa water was stagnant for many, many weeks uh, there. And we all know that the flood frequency table, when we look at this for this site, it, we, can, we can see how the frequency of floods is really increasing. It's very much stark and uh, evident from, from these uh, data. Uh, one thing that uh, we have to understand is that our heritage is not adapted. The, the material, the construction techniques are not really adapted to this kind of changing climatic pattern. So what we find, for example, in this case in Leh in India, is the adobe construction uh, was very badly damaged when we had cloud burst uh, because such kind of uh, heavy rains were not really suitable for that kind of construction. So we are really facing this inherent problem of the way heritage is being designed and constructed. It's not really able to take this kind of changing pattern. It's not just uh, floods and uh, storms, but also fires, because we know that with uh, forest fires have become much more prevalent now, and many of the heritage sites, uh, such as in this case in Greece, uh, many heritage sites are actually at greater risk because of these forest fires that happen during uh, summer uh, months every year. Uh, what we have to really understand is that it's not just floods or, uh, or cyclones or flooding. It's a combination of these things which is making disasters very, very complex. So we are not just talking about only storm or floods or uh, individual hazard events, but this combination that comes together through sea level rise, for example, in this case in Zanzibar, uh, the, it's a sea level rise, which is a big threat, plus cyclones and flooding. So one has to understand this kind of complexity which comes in when these uh, hazards interact with each other. And when we see how these hydrometeorological hazards are really increasing, we know that climate change is there and it is impacting our heritage uh, very, very strongly. 
Now, what we have to really understand, it's not just climate in itself. It is a combination of factors which we have to think together. It's urbanization, which is in fact one of the bigger challenges, which cannot be looked at separated because the climate variability, urbanization, and also poverty, because of which many of, many in many developing countries, heritage is not being able, is not being maintained well. So these factors are really combining together to have impact, uh, which is physical, social, economic, environmental, and definitely on cultural heritage. And we, we cannot really look at this separated from each other. It's a combination of developmental factors, climatic factors, and the factors which are re related to human development that, that come together to, to create this impact. So how would climate change impact cultural heritage? Uh, we all know, we have seen examples where flooding is less frequent, but it is very heavy. So it may trigger other disasters such as landslide. We find that the amount of rain coming in such smaller time interval is really more than, uh, more to, uh, uh, heritage is not able to really address that kind of uh, uh, intensity. Then we also find that hedges sites in extreme dry areas may be at risk due to forest fires, as I just showed you in an example. And some sites, coastal sites especially, might be submerged in the sea. Uh, there is also an impact on people because many of these sites are uninhabitable or become increasingly un uninhabitable and that may in fact impact intangible heritage because many of the rituals and practices will no longer be able to be uh, continued in these areas. And also, of course, uh, there is going to be, and we all already see increased conflict over scarce resources, and water, it seems, is going to be one of the main causes of conflict. So what the kind of conflicts we see today are just, uh, one has to understand the root causes, and climate is actually going to be one of the factors. So one, what one has to really understand is that climate change and disasters are very closely linked to each other. And there are statistics which say that 76% of disaster events are hydrological, meteorological, and climatic climatological in nature. So we cannot look at disaster risk reduction separated from climate change. This is a fact that has to be addressed because it is, uh, if we don't look at it sep together, uh, probably our, our uh, efforts would not be so successful. Now what are the challenges in integrated, integrating climate change and disaster risk reduction? Now climate change may expose people to risks in the long term while disaster risks for which governments traditionally plan may have had a comparatively shorter period. So this is a fundamental difference between disaster risk, it is right there, it happens, it's a short-term thing, but climate change is much more long-term planning. Uh, then climate change, and this is one of the factors we have to really recognize, is it's mainly understood from an environmental science perspective. While disaster risk reduction has traditionally focused on an event, it's more of an incident management or, and has been more focused on risk mitigation and exposure reduction. So again, we see that many times disaster risk reduction comes under home ministry or ministry of defense or civil defense, while climate change comes under the environmental sector. And because of these two dip different departments, there is very lack, uh, there is much uh, lack of coordination between these two, while we see that they are so much interconnected. Uh, climate change impacts may also have a high degree of uncertainty and it is difficult to predict impacts on populations solely on the basis of past and present trends. So, so this is something which gives us a kind of a challenge to see climate change and disaster risk reduction in a common uh, framework. Now we all know that the international frameworks for climate change adaptation have been agreed uh, uh, through uh, UNFCC which, is, which was actually agreed upon in 1992. And in fact, there was recognition of people's vulnerability to climate change, and uh, there was a big emphasis on adaptation, particularly in developing countries. And what we also recognize is that in Bali Action Plan of 2007, it was already recognized that disaster risk reduction strategies are an important component of climate change adaptation. So at the international policy level, these were really recognized. But when it came down to national policies, we find a challenge that climate change and disaster risk reduction are not really uh, uh, having a synergy, and we are not yet talking about culture in it. So, so one should really um, understand that there is a bigger challenge here. Uh, there is no clear recognition of cultural heritage in the international framework for climate change. Although in disaster risk reduction, as I think in the uh, keynote by Jerry, uh, you would have heard that there is now a very clear recognition of cultural heritage in the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, which was adopted earlier this year. 
So uh, we see that although in disaster risk reduction, cultural heritage in the international policy framework gets recognition, yet there is a gap between climate change adaptation, disaster risk reduction, and cultural heritage uh, uh, management. This is the real challenge we are facing today. That the policies are very much centered around themes, disaster risk reduction having its own climate change adaptation and conservation of culture. It is, so the, the, the thing that we have to really address now is how do we bring them together? Because we are talking about sustainable development if we, uh, the SDGs are now being revised uh, and development is a big factor which creates vulnerability. Uh, climate change adaptation, disaster risk reduction and heritage conservation management have to interact with each other. This also implies that there has to be coordination between stakeholders from these four different areas, which sometimes can be very diverse. So for example, environment sector in climate change adaptation has to very much closely work together with the development sector. And of course, heritage sector, which uh, uh, including private owners, community, and the, the organizations responsible for culture. So we have to create this kind of uh, links that, uh, will, uh, that will only address um, our major issue. We cannot no longer work in isolation. I just wanted to give, conclude by giving example from the city of York uh, as a positive example of where things have actually been achieved. This, uh, so York has been a, a very regularly affected by flooding and uh, several flood mitigation measures have been in fact adopted at the city level uh, for protecting uh, cultural heritage and also for saving people's lives when the floods uh, occur. Uh, it has also been uh, recognized that it is not really possible to just prevent these hazards. So there is a clear policy recognition that adaptation has to be there in the way flood frequency is going to increase. So that was very much recognized in the City of York Council in 2015, earlier this year, which I think is a very strong statement that at the policy level you are recognizing adaptation as an important policy for heritage protection and management at the urban level. It, this also meant that the city municipality, English Heritage, and the department responsible for flood management, as well as city residents, have actually fostered our, a close co collaboration in order to manage these, uh, this changing pattern of floods. And I think this is an example that has to be replicated. An important thing to be considered is that it has to work at both levels, at the national level as well at the site level, because we cannot do many things at the site level if the policy level integration doesn't happen. And the other way around is also uh, quite critical. We may have policies at a higher level, but if, the, if the, at the site level there is no links with different authorities and stakeholders, our efforts is not gonna succeed. So we have to really try and make, uh, impl implement, uh, uh, we have to mainstream heritage in both DRR and climate change policies and systems of uh, operationalizing them. Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup, Rohit Digyasu, pour cette intervention très stimulante et qui nous, nous rappelle avec force euh, à la fois la nécessité d'intégrer euh, les questions patrimoniales dans les autres euh, aspects euh, de gestion du risque auxquels euh, les pays et la communauté internationale ont, ont à faire face en matière de, de changement climatique. Euh, véritablement, c'est quelque chose de, de tout à fait important, euh, dont j'espère d'ailleurs que euh, l'Assemblée générale prendra soigneusement note et, et acte. Euh, J'aimerais maintenant donner la parole à Martine Frick. Martine, nous vous connaissons, vous nous avez parlé euh, au cours de notre cérémonie inaugurale, et je rappelle que vous êtes ici euh, à la FAO en charge de ces questions de changement climatique. Thank you very much <clears throat> and a good morning to everybody. Um, we just learned in the presentation how climate change is affecting um, cultural heritage and that's not a surprise because climate change is affecting about everything and anything. Um, men have been constructed, women have been constructed and everything that consists our cultural heritage. In fact, <clears throat> I think mankind was never confronted with an all-encompassing problem such as climate change. Maybe the threat of nuclear warfare can be compared because also that could lead to um, global annihilation. 
but otherwise I think we never had such an interdependent and complex problem such as climate change. Here FAO has a mandate to ensure food security and of course climate change is all over our work because the impact that climate change is causing are already today mostly felt in agriculture. You know the numbers that FAO is publishing, 800 million people are still hungry every single day despite all the progress we have made. There is a sustainable development goal now on eradicating hunger by 2030 which went almost unnoticed and now think back for the last 5,000 years to eradicate hunger on a global scale really is a historic task. Um, I think it's absolutely doable, but it will be much more difficult with climate change. We have as many adaptation measures. Um, we are looking into every possibility because we have to look into every possibility and one of the strong um, findings that we have in climate change adaptation is that we actually look into the past. There are agricultural systems that um, when we now consider them were built a thousand, two thousand years ago that are so sophisticated and so well adapted to the surroundings that we can only learn from them. We can basically say that over the last 800,000 years there was a very stable climatic corridor um, that actually made human civilization possible. In this privilege of having a very, very stable climate, um, civilization could flourish, um, agriculture was invented and agriculture as we know was the precondition for the first urban high cultures. And as we know, and I said it yesterday, the disappearance of many of these early high cultures are directly related to failure of agriculture. Now, these were catastrophes in their own rights, but they were limited. If you look at um, early cultures like the Maya, we were dealing with 50,000, 100,000, maybe 500,000 people. Today, we risk no less than affecting 9 billion people prospectively in 2050. So, I don't want to give you a technical presentation because you're not experts in agriculture, although it is very difficult not to speak about food in this beautiful country, which is all about fantastic food and an expert to all over the world. But maybe using the opportunity to having an audience that is occupied with somebody, something completely else to speak about complexity and interdependence. Just to remind you, in 2011, there were um, heat waves all over Europe and as a consequence of it there were peat fires all around Moscow. The peat fires seriously impacted on the Russian production of grains and at one point um, President Medvedev, who was at the time in charge, decreed a stop of exporting grains. That had a massive impact in the Middle East and North Africa region which is one of the heaviest grain importers on the planet. In some places the price for bread threefold within days. Um, it would be oversimplifying to say this is what caused the Arab Spring, but it was certainly one of the pressure points that yield to an outburst of um, unrest in the, um, in the region, sometimes for the good, but also for the bad. And today, if we are facing barbarism, like in Paris a couple of days ago, these are the very same people who are blowing up cultural heritage for the sake of their belief systems. Why do you do that? Why do you destroy cultural heritage? I think it's a question of identity in a perverted sense. A primitive way of finding your identity is to say I'm different from others and what makes me the person I am is that I hate everybody else. That is, I think, what we are up against. On the contrary, um, and I said that yesterday as well, I'm heartened by the fact that the climate summit that is going to start in a couple of days in Paris is going on as planned. And that is a big sign of civilization that we are not frightened. We are not frightened by people who are affecting us in the most brutal way. And I think the climate negotiations, and that might sound strange, but I mean it, are really a question about civilization and advancing civilization. Um, there is nothing more globalized than climate change. CO2 emissions are the most globalized problem you have. When you drive a car today in Rome and you could track your CO2 emissions, you could actually find them in Australia in about six weeks. 
So everything we do anywhere on the planet affects everybody of us. And that is the big civilizational lesson we have to learn, <clears throat> and we don't have an alternative to learning. If you think back, human civilization evolved into always larger entities, from the family to the tribe, from the tribe to the state, from the state to national states, leading to the catastrophes of two world wars. <clears throat> In my region of the world, actually founding of a supranational um, entity, the European Union, which is still working with all its challenges. But now I think we really have to understand um, humanity as an entirety and the problems that we are having as the problems of the entire world. And we cannot fix it alone. Even the most mightiest nation in the world cannot fix climate change alone. So if we go into the climate negotiations in Paris, <clears throat> there's more at stake than a technical problem to be fixed. It is, amongst other things, the question of actually, will we have a rules-based world in the future? Will we be able, will we be continuing solving our problems in a peaceful way? in frameworks like the United Nations, or will we resort back to um, nationalism, to violence, to closing borders, to basically undo what we have trying to do over the last decades. And <clears throat> as this audience is working with cultural heritage, it might be a very good moment to look back and see why other cultures have failed before, and bear in mind that this time it's about all of us. And with that, um, I very much hope to learn from this exercise. Um, I think the biggest challenge that this century has is that we built a so complex world and a so complicated world that we have experts all over the place who are fantastic in what they are doing, but often are lacking a little bit of lateral thinking. And I'm really heartened by this opportunity to speak people, with people who do something completely else, and I'm very much looking forward to a mutual learning experience. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Martin Frick, pour cette euh, mise en perspective euh, à la fois euh, voilà, concernant l'histoire humaine, l'histoire des civilisations et même l'histoire euh, climatique, euh, mise en perspective euh, qui éclaire le, le moment essentiel dans lequel, euh, dans lequel nous, nous, nous nous trouvons aujourd'hui. Euh, merci aussi pour cette euh, vision euh, euh, plus, plus, plus globale, un petit peu de l'extérieur euh, que vous portez sur euh, nos débats et, leur, euh, et leurs enjeux et le rappel de l'importance entre l'articulation de, 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 de l'échelle locale et de, de l'échelle globale. Nous allons maintenant entendre deux, deux autres interventions euh, qui s'inscrivent dans, dans, dans la volonté d'entendre de, de, euh, les expériences, euh, les leçons aussi euh, euh, tirées, parfois dans des conditions euh, extrêmement dramatiques, euh, leçons tirées par, par euh, nos, nos pays membres. Et j'aimerais appeler euh, Virgilio Reyes à à s'exprimer. Euh, Virgilio est membre du conseil de l'ICROM. Virgilio a été euh, ambassadeur de son pays pendant plus de 35 ans et euh, va nous parler euh, de l'expérience euh, et des, des, des enseignements euh, de, reçus, par, reçus et, et, et communiqués aujourd'hui par la Philippine euh, suite euh, à la catastrophe qu'elle a vécue. Virgilio Reyes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and good morning to all. Uh, my topic for this morning is climate change, disaster risk reduction, and cultural heritage, the Philippine example. The Philippines was uh, brought once more to world attention. Um, shall I uh, switch the picture now? Number two. The Philippines was brought once more to world attention within the context of this topic in October and November 2013 following earthquakes on the centrally located islands of Bohol and Cebu in, in the Visayas, which severely affected many historical structures, the megatyphoon Haiyan, known locally as Yolanda, sets its fury on the nearby islands of Leyte and Samar, resulting in catastrophic loss of human lives and causing much destruction, mayhem, and suffering in this region. 
I think by now we should have switched to the second. So am I the one who's going to? Uh, okay, thank you. So uh, in the third slide, which we'll see soon, the Philippines sits on the so-called Pacific Rim of Fire, which renders it vulnerable to earthquakes occurring roughly every 18 months and volcano eruptions. It is also subject to the El Nino and La Nina phenomena. Secondly, uh, it has an average of around 20 typhoons a year, with five according to Mr. Arnulfo Dado, generally expected to cause major damage to life and property. Since it is normally the first country to be affected by weather disturbances which originate in the Pacific. I think we one slide, uh, we should have one slide more in addition to this. Thank you. Um, and then we move on to the next slide. In terms of cultural heritage, the Philippines is the repository of many World Heritage sites, both in terms of landscape and historical or cultural treasures. Among these are the oldest church in Manila, San Agustin, the Santa Maria and Pauay churches in the Ilocos region, the Philispanic town of Vigan, the Banawe Rice Terraces, and Tubataba Reef. Next, please. With reference to climate change, there are now new Philippine disaster risk reduction and climate change laws, which mandate the inclusion of uh, DRR and climate change, respectively, in school curricula. Previous to these, however, there were already measures taken to confront these new challenges in the Philippines. The National Disaster Coordinating Council member agencies are responsible for carrying out respective tasks and responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis natural disasters. Recently, the Asian Disaster Preparedness Center and the UN Development Program with support from the European Commission on Humanitarian Aid and Civil Protection, has assisted the Department of Education in the Philippines, but also in Cambodia and Laos, to integrate disaster risk reduction into the secondary school curriculum. Next slide, please. Today, a summer camp exercise helps children feel more safe and secure in a project called Philippines Save the Children. Quoting from a report, I wish to cite the case of Jessica, who is a grade four pupil in a high-risk municipality in Albay, only eight kilometers from the Mayon volcano in Luzon. She is one of the many children who witnessed the devastation of Typhoon Durian in November 2006 that caused massive deaths due to mudslides from loosened slopes of the nearby volcano. Jessica and 616 other pupils from 22 high-risk public elementary schools attended the children's summer camp to learn how to prepare for and respond to disasters, thus increasing their understanding of the hazard and climate change context. At the camp, she participated in a drill scenario of a 7.5 over 10 magnitude earthquake that also triggers a fire that results in mass casualties on the campus. She learned inter alia how to lead her classmates to the safe holding area, to perform basic first aid on her classmates, and to respond to the instructions of the adult members of the Emergency Response Team Security Committee. Let me also quote from another case study. The Philippines added climate change and volcano hazards into its disaster risk reduction curriculum. The relevant lessons addressed, what is climate change? They then asked what is its impact, and finally, how can you reduce climate change impact? Other lessons focused on the climate system, typhoons, heat waves, and landslides, among other related topics. The Philippines' final disaster risk reduction module was integrated into 12 lessons in science and 16 lessons in social studies for the first year of secondary school. As stated, disasters can be substantially reduced if people are well informed and motivated to prevent risk and to build their own resilience. Next slide, please. Having visited the site of Typhoon Haiyan in Tacloban City, with the Director General of FAO, Graciano da Silva, shortly after the disaster, I myself learned how important it is not only for the school children, 
but also for their parents to be informed on such topics and concretely on terminology. On an anecdotal level, first it was recounted that not many of the citizens, mostly among the very poor in Tacloban City, took the storm warning seriously because typhoons occur on such a regular basis in the region. They also tended to live along the coast and in low-lying areas, first to be affected by the floodwaters and the storm in general. Secondly, many of them did not know terminology such as storm surge in English, and therefore did not know how to react when this was used as a warning. Had the erroneous term tsunami even been used as a warning, perhaps more could have been saved since they were familiar with that, which, what had happened recently in Japan. Thirdly, instead of staying in the stadium where they had been housed as a precaution, some actually stampeded in panic, most unfortunately, to their deaths. In the Philippine Department of Science and Technology, two programs have been geared to confront climate change and natural disasters, known eponymously as DREAM and NOAA. Next slide, please. In 2011, the DREAM program, or the Disaster Risk and Exposure Assessment for Mitigation, was formed in response to the echoing need to better prepare the country and its people for natural disasters by producing up-to-date, detailed, and high-resolution three-dimensional flood hazard maps for the critical river basins in the Philippines, it envisions to make the dream of a more resilient Philippines a reality. Next slide. On the other hand, NOAA, or the Nationwide Operational Assessment of Hazards, was launched for the Philippines warning agencies to be able to provide a six-hour lead time warning to vulnerable communities against impending floods and to use advanced technology to enhance current geohazard vulnerability maps. The project NOAA website can be accessed to any internet browser uh, by typing the URL, which is uh, here, http www.noaa.dost government ph. It can also be researched using Google by typing Project NOAA and clicking the first entry on the list of results. Next slide. There's also a crowdsourcing technique called nababaha.com, which in Filipino means it is flooding, whereby one can report about a flood event in a particular area and their corresponding level using as a gauge the height of our top boxer, Manny Pacquiao, five foot six and a half inches, or 1.69 meters. Last slide. The Philippines is perhaps a textbook case of a developing country, which though rich in acknowledged cultural heritage and natural sites, and with a growing constituency of advocates and supporters, still does not have an approach and a plan which factors in cultural heritage within its disaster risk reduction plans. The earthquakes destroyed so many church buildings in Bohol, which had survived the vicissitudes of war and modernization. We were grateful for international response in this regard, particularly the initiatives of UNESCO and ICROM to do a study and assessment of our heritage structures damaged or destroyed in the wake of Typhoon Haiyan and the earthquakes which occurred. Thank you. Maraming salamat po. Merci beaucoup, Virgilio. Nous allons maintenant entendre Kirk Cordell. Euh, après 38 ans au, au sein du Service national des parcs, euh, euh, à travailler pour ce qui concerne la préservation et le, et le management du patrimoine, euh, Kirk, vous dirigez à présent le National Center for Preservation Technology and Training au sein de ce même service des parcs et vous allez nous présenter à la fois les procédures euh, et les recherches euh, d'action mises en œuvre pour lutter contre le changement climatique et ses conséquences au sein euh, de votre service national, mais euh, aussi euh, la manière dont vous développez aujourd'hui des réponses euh, à l'échelle de l'ensemble de, de, votre, de votre pays. Je vous remercie. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be able to address you this morning. 
As she mentioned, I'm the director of the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training, and our mission is to bring uh, new uh, science and technology to apply to the conservation of historic uh, properties. And so we have programs in architecture and landscape architecture and in archaeology and in materials conservation. And we do research at our own laboratories and we, um, we fund research at universities and other nonprofits across the United States. Next slide, please. Um, we are part of the National Park System of the United States, and there are 408 units of the Park Service across the continental United States and in Alaska, uh, Hawaii, and in uh, five territories. And so um, you may be familiar with some of these sites. Uh, there are large natural reserves like Yosemite or Yellowstone or the Grand Canyon in the west or um, uh, the Everglades or Great Smoky Mountains in the east. But many people are not aware that about three quarters of our sites are set aside for the historic value. So we have everything from the Statue of Liberty to Independence Hall where the, where the um, Declaration of Independence was signed to the homes of important people like uh, the birth home of Dr. Martin Luther King. So the, the service itself is responsible for a great number of both natural and cultural resources across the United States. Next please. In addition to our responsibilities for things that are held at the federal government level, we also are responsible for identifying the, um, the historic resources that are in private and uh, state and local uh, municipal hands. So uh, we maintain National Register of Historic Places and National Landmark listings that, that designate uh, those, um, those kinds of properties and uh, make technical assistance available to the, them. Uh, things that are listed in that register are a um, eligible for a very robust tax incentive program for properties that are in commercial use. And so uh, the, um, the inclusion of properties in that list uh, helps to um, encourage their rehabilitation. It also protects them from inadvertent destruction by uh, large federal uh, construction projects as well. Next, please. Um, like the Philippines and some of the other areas in the United States, North America is in sort of a path of, uh, of major storm centers. And so this is a, just a chart to show you that by way of a little background. Uh, this is the, the hurricane tracking uh, in the east for, from, uh, from the early 1850s and in the western side from, um, from 1949. But gives you an idea of the number of, of hurricane level tropical cyclones that strike the continental United States. Next, please. Uh, the, um, another, another part of the background of this is, is how the increasing levels of storms and the increasing intensity of storms is causing so much damage in the country. And this is a chart that shows you uh, the number of, of uh, disasters that have caused more than a billion dollars of damage um, by state in the United States. And so the darker the state, the more damage that they've had. And you can see that Texas in the southern uh, central part of this slide has had 35 um, storms that caused more than a billion dollars of damage just since 2004. And you, uh, so you can see that particularly in the central and southeastern United States that we've had a great deal of damage uh, as a result of these stronger storm systems. Uh, next, please. The real wake up call for us was in 2005 with Hurricane Katrina when the um, theoretical aspects of climate change became very present for us. Uh, Hurricane Katrina was the largest and most powerful storm to ever strike um, the United States and it, uh, it caused um, a great deal of damage for us. Uh, I don't know if you can see the little red star in the upper left quadrant of the storm, but that's where my center is located in, in north central Louisiana, just east of Texas there. So we, we were on the outskirts of Hurricane Tr Katrina, and because we were some of the closest assets that the National Park Service had, we became heavily involved in the response to the disaster. Next, please. So just to give you some idea of the scope of this, um, it, it, in the history of our uh, preservation programs for the last 50 years, it's by far the largest uh, uh, storm uh, damage that's ever occurred. Uh, uh, so roughly $125 billion of damage in, the, in an area covering more than 90,000 square miles. So we've seen very few things in our uh, history in the United States uh, of such magnitude. And it, it damaged the greatest number of uh, heritage resources in, in, in a storm that in the last 50 years as well. And also then resulted in more assistance being given to um, historic um, resources there as well. Next, please. So for my own research center, we responded in a number of ways. And uh, the first thing we realized is that we didn't have good condition assessment tools. And so we worked on those. I'll speak more about those in a moment. 
We also embedded our own staff of technical experts in with our uh, emergency management. The FEMA is the Federal Emergency Management uh, Agency, which manages the response to large-scale disasters in the United States. So we embedded our technical experts with them in the, in the uh, uh, response uh, field offices for that. Uh, we created a web-based clearinghouse for information on disaster response. There really wasn't anything in the states that was very useful at that time on that. And then we began to engage other topics that were addressed. One thing that came up is that our Corps of Engineers, which was doing some of the response, that they would quickly go in after a storm and tarp buildings, but their regulations specifically prevented them from tarping the roofs of historic structures because they didn't understand historic roofing systems. So we funded projects very quickly to go in and create um, guidance on how to tarp over um, uh, slate or uh, wood shingles or, or um, uh, tile shingle roofs and, and other things like that. It was very simple things, but we had never run into these before. So, so many of these things came up for the first time for us in Katrina. Uh, we also offered wet recovery and disaster management and response workshops and provided a great deal of uh, technical assistance to the state and local governments. Next, please. Uh, I mentioned the building and site condition assessment. We, we realized in just the first days after the storm that we did, did not have a good system for gathering information about what had been damaged and how much. So we uh, gathered a consortium of about 20 uh, agencies and nonprofit organizations and, and together developed this, um, this building and site condition assessment form, which could be put on um, tablet computers and taken out in the field. What we discovered from this, though, is that you have to have these things done well in advance. In the terms of the crisis, the various governmental agencies were not willing to adopt a new system at that time. So people ended up gathering uh, information in their existing inventory systems, which were not connected with each other and didn't speak to each other at all. Um, next slide, please. Um, so one of the other things that became very apparent is that though we knew where our historic resources were generally, we didn't know where they were specifically. And these are three separate maps of New Orleans at the time of the storm. On the upper left one is the, is the a number of individual points. You can see there's just hardly any. Those are just um, boundaries of historic districts that were listed in our National Register. Um, and those are the historic districts are, like most historic districts, a combination of historic structures and non-historic and modern structures. And we didn't know within there specifically uh, which ones were the historic ones. And when, when the area is cut off from everyone else and only emergency responders are in, you need to be able to tell them which ones are the historic buildings because they don't know when they look at them. And so the upper right shows the number of points that were added in the surveys that were done immediately after Katrina. So you can see a, a great number of, uh, of uh, data points now appear. Each of those represents a single historic resource. And then after we did our um, rehabilitation programs and funded reconstruction of some of these buildings, you can see in the lower slide that we now have about 60,000 point locations for individual structures and sites in New Orleans. And that still doesn't include some of these uh, historic districts. One of the ones that has no points in it is the Vieux Carre, probably the most historic section of the city. But um, we, I showed this slide to highlight the, um, the fact that we had very little idea of, uh, about specific information that could be passed on to first responders, and uh, we needed to, to be able to gather that information more specifically and do it ahead of the disasters. Next slide, please. Um, that that uh, disaster response methodology, then, we kept, what we ended up doing, because everyone used disparate um, uh, inventory systems as we had to come in and try to get all those things to talk to each other and share that information with our emergency responders. So um, we ended up doing a massive GIS project and uh, establishing metadata standards and sharing data among different inventory systems so that they could all be collated together. If you're interested in that, we documented that, um, that methodology thoroughly and it's a, in a publication that you can see at this place um, that's cited here and I can give you that citation later if you need. Next please. Uh, we also went, then moved after the storm to start developing other uh, kinds of um, resources. I think someone mentioned earlier today the Northeast Document Conservation Center, and we funded a project with them to develop D-Plan, which is a disaster planning tool for archives and museum properties. It helps them just it walks them through the steps that, that they need to, to go through in order to be prepared for uh, a disaster. And this has been come, become widely used by archives and museum facilities in the United States now. Uh, next slide. And uh, where we had little information before, the Park Service made a very significant effort then to, to uh, post on the web uh, a large number of resources. You can see in the upper left quadrant, that's my own center, but our uh, heritage documentation programs that, that, uh, that um, 
do measure drawings of historic structures, uh, and the GIS program have their own sites. The museum management program has um, posted a lot of conservagrams, which are technical guidance on treating uh, historic, I mean, uh, museum resources, and um, also our, our, our grants programs that help um, in the recovery of uh, historic properties as well. Next, please. Uh, just an incident that's not directly uh, um, climate related, but the, uh, the BP oil spill uh, came in just a couple of years later, and um, the, the fact that we had then begun to really um, chart where our historic resources were very specifically in GIS systems and to understand the coastal erosion that was going on made it a lot easier for us to work with um, the emergency responders there. You can see the light blue there is the oil the oil sheen, and we charted the oil sheen day to day to see where it was going, and some historic resources were damaged, and we did research on the removal of, um, of oil from the masonry structures there as well. But um, fortunately, the, uh, the, the oil spill didn't turn out as bad as it could have been for cultural resources. It was a, an unmitigated disaster uh, environmentally, but um, a, a lot of the oil did not make landfall. Only a few major sites were affected. Next, please. So then uh, when we thought we sort of had our act together, then Hurricane Sandy came along in, um, in uh, 2012. And this is a map of the United States. You can see the storm affecting uh, most of the east coast of the United States and Canada. And again, um, this was the, the most powerful storm that ever struck this part of, the, out of our country as well. Next, please. And. Um, some of my staff and myself both deployed with our emergency management agency to help with the recovery effort. And one of the most frustrating things was to realize that still, all these years later, we didn't have good uh, condition assessment data immediately after the storm. The folks that were doing emergency response were looking at life safety issues as they well should, first of all, but then also infrastructure and community planning needs. But no one was gathering information on the condition of the historic structures and sites and which ones had been affected and in what ways. And it was very difficult to mount the research resources um, that could help people with specific issues when we didn't know what the specific issues were. So uh, out of frustration with not being able to accomplish what we needed to, I brought my staff up from my center in Louisiana and we started developing a mobile-based condition assessment programs. And so, next slide. We developed a, a mobile, co mobile condition assessment program that, that's based for smartphones and it can be on, a, on an uh, iOS phone or an Android phone. And it takes advantage of the fact that you have a good camera and a GPS in in the phone, and so um, it has multiple pages that are, um, uh, as you can go through and you do a condition assessment on the historic structure and what's been damaged and how, and depending on what you respond, it can bring up other, other things for you to answer. And so we, we found this was a very quick way that we could um, gather a great deal of information with teams that could go out. They already had the equipment in their pockets because most people had those things already. And um, we designed the system so that it could um, save data to the phone itself if the cell towers were down and there was no access to the internet. Or if, um, and then that when you went back to your hotel or wherever else you had access to the internet, it would automatically upload. Or if you're in the field and the cell towers are still up, it would, um, upload the data in real time, so every time somebody finished a building, it would automatically appear on our servers back in Louisiana. Um, next slide. Uh, some of the other ways that we um, tried to improve our ability to respond is we worked with the um, Heritage um, Emergency National Task Force, which is a consortium of agencies and private nonprofits in the United States that work on re response issues for cultural resources. And you may be familiar with their um, their paper wheel. It's a triage wheel to apply to um, museum collections and, and historic home collections and that sort of thing immediately after a storm. And it tells you, like, if you have paper or wood and it's been damaged, it's wet or it's whatever the damage has been. What are the things that, that the um, a institution needs to do immediately to stabilize the situation until the conservators can be brought in to treat that. And that's been a very popular thing that's translated into about 18 languages around the world. We've now can made, also made it a... Um, a mobile application, that's what you see on the right. So all of the stuff that used to be on the wheel, it still is on the wheel if you want the paper wheel with you. But everyone, ha now you can have it on your phone and you can go through and, and do that emergency triage uh, based on the material that you have with you at hand. Next slide. So uh, as we began to continue to um, address these disasters, we, uh, and we're looking at climate change re uh, research that's going on, we really began to realize that we needed to begin, begin to um, evaluate how vulnerable our resources were. And uh, this is some preliminary work on vulnerability of uh, resources along our coastal areas. The darker the color, the darker red it is, the more vulnerable it is. Um, next slide. 
And then just to show you the most extreme example, this is a National Geographic um, map of what the North, North America would look like if, if all the polar ice melted. And you can see that my state, Louisiana, is almost entirely gone. The whole state of Florida is gone. And uh, most of our historic settlements, um, both of English uh, settlement and Spanish settlement on both coasts, are completely underwater at this point. Um, so we certainly hope we don't see this scenario, but um, that that's the, it, the, the impacts on the United States will be of, in, of sea level rise and the threat of sea level rise are quite severe and they're not being addressed very well uh, by our country yet, but we're certainly beginning to work on it. And, and our cultural resources tend to be, cut, both, both historic and prehistoric settlements tend to be located along our coasts and riverine systems and they're the most vulnerable to this kind of uh, climate effect. Next, please. So we've begun to do a lot of work in uh, climate change policy now and to try to get material out. You can see these are some examples of, of different kinds of webinars and stuff where we're trying to teach our staff and the public about how to, um, what they need to do to be prepared for disasters and how to respond to climate change issues. Uh, next, please. And then uh, the Park Service itself has now done a, a climate change strategy and it's sort of based on these four pillars here that you see. And this is across all resource categories, uh, the, although the greatest work has been on natural resource management so far, but really basing it on good science, um, on mitigation of, of immediate effects on adaptation and on being able to communicate these issues with others in an effective way. Um, so we are now then beginning to move forward with cultural resource climate change planning and policy development as well. Next, please. And so we, we've developed an action plan that, that's been out for a couple of years now that's beginning to identify the issues and, and talk about the different types of resources we have across the country. Not everything is related to the coasts, of course, and increased storms and, and earthquakes. And, fi and then with um, the increase in the number of fires, we have a lot of in, uh, resources in the interior that are affected by climate change issues as well. Next, next please. So in, in that document, you see sort of all the, all the different kinds of effects they are, and this is... Um, they're kind of amusing way of looking at all the words in English that I'll end with ION that I'll talk about the different kinds of effects. And we're just trying to begin to discuss with policymakers and with our uh, senior management about what are all the different ways that our resources are threatened and are being affected by the shifts that we're seeing in the climate. Next, please. And we are just now, I've just now released, actually it's not released to the public, it's released for internal review just a couple of weeks ago now, and a new cultural resources climate change strategy. And so I, we, I hope that we'll have that um, to share with you and to get your comments and input on in, in the near future as well. And then um, I think next slide. And the, the most recent thing that we've been involved in is one of the other things that um, became apparent to us is that lay people or homeowners, people who are not technically trained or are not working in agencies, have very little information, at least that's true in our country, about what they should do. So uh, with some uh, emergency management money that came through the state of Louisiana, we just developed this resilient heritage guide. This is for homeowners, uh, not, not, for, um, not for agencies and not for... Um, not for technical people or architects. It's if you own a home and you have a flood or you've got wind damage or you're in an earthquake, what are the things you need to do to prepare for those things ahead of time? And if those things happen, what should you do to respond and where do you go, get, go to get help? And so I have a couple of copies of this with me and we can make any of those things available to you uh, afterwards. But these are some of the things that we've been doing to try to... Um, to get a handle on the things that we don't know. And I would say that we're still in the early stages of being able to address these issues, but we're trying to bring the best science uh, uh, to bear on development of policy and communication tools that can help us to reach the public and help them to know how to prepare for disasters and then to help our responders know how to respond better because cultural resources have not had the, um, the kind of profile that they need to have in, in the uh, early response efforts. Uh, I think that's the last one. Next, please. So um, thank you very much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Merci beaucoup, Kirk. Je vais maintenant donner la parole à Monsieur Stéphane Simon. Euh, Stéphane Simon est scientifique et dirige à l'Université de, de, de Yale euh, l'Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage. Euh, Stéphane, je vous remercie de, de me rejoindre. Vous allez nous parler euh, de, du concept de Green Museum, sur lequel vous réfléchissez et travaillez depuis de, de longues années, euh, afin d'illustrer cette fois-ci la manière dont euh, les, professe les professionnels du patrimoine peuvent également, euh, à leur 
leur niveau, contribuer euh, non seulement à lutter contre les effets du changement climatique, mais euh, à leur mesure à, 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 à limiter euh, le changement climatique. Merci. Thank you very much. Um, we now go away from the disaster to the, the world where nothing happens. I mean the museum. Only humidity goes up and down and um, temperatures goes up and down, but actually it's the aim and not much should happen actually in the museum. And uh, there have been many attempts for risk management in the past years also with uh, ICROM and uh, with the Canadian Conservation Institute, the ICN, and many others uh, have been in this involved. And um, I, I'd just like to ask you to, to go to this little window to the museum where we are far away from, from the disasters for the next 10 minutes. So what is a green museum? A green museum is a museum which has included all the three columns of sustainability into its operations program, but also in its physical setting. We have seen in the past years a change in objectives from the idea to protect cultural heritage without any change. We come into some acceptance of change, into some management of change, which actually is connected to you know, a change from a regulatory, rule-based, you know, preventive conservation approach to a pragmatic risk management. So these minutes will be devoted to the good museum climate or what is known in the United States of America, the plus-minus dilemma since an AIC conference a few years ago. Um, well, traditionally, we have climatization in our buildings. We have natural air exchange through leakage, windows, doors, uh, and we have to remember that the first HVAC system, the first climatization system, at least in my country of Germany, came in the 1950s, end of the 50s, 60s. So every object which has lived until then, you have to know that it has lived in a condition without air condition. I think it's an important fact to remember. Um, well, conservation requests are pretty simple. Temperature should be rather low. Relative humidity should not fluctuate too much, should be according to the absorption characteristics. Low air speed, you know, not too much dust. I think that's pretty clear. Um, there's a, a contradiction between our well-being and the well-being of the artifacts. It's hard to make uh, the temperature in the museum lower than 19 degrees Celsius just, you know, for the uh, workers, workers uh, security, you know, they, they, they don't want to work, you know, below 19 degrees for health reasons. Most artifacts would be quite happy with 15, 14, with lower temperatures, but it's a little bit hypocrite to say, well, we have to have 20 degrees Celsius and 50% flat because 20, uh, 20 degrees Celsius, this is only us, and not necessarily the paintings or the furniture or the retumbles. Um, in 2012, the BISO group, group of great museums, uh, issued the interim guidelines, and which is a very hot debate and, and uh, probably the hottest debate in, in museum conservation context over the last years. It's about widening the RH corridor from what is often claimed to be 50% RH flat to 40-60. I have actually to say that the Smithsonian Institute has been a uh, a leader in this discussion already 20 years ago has been actually uh, advocating for widening the, the corridor of uh, preservation in, in the museum. Um, of course, the last sentence in this slide is also important that a conservative evaluation is essential in establishing the appropriate environmental conditions. So this is not something which is just, you know, taught upon like ex cathedra. This is, this is a an interim guideline, a tentative guideline, which is up to be validated and checked by conservators. Because, of course, nobody wants to put our collections at stake. But let's take a look at the reality. Those are now quickly, like, a few diagrams of relative humidity temperature. A church, temperature fluctuation between 30 and 75 percent our age. You know, in Europe, the majority of our cultural heritage actually is in churches. Um, and many of the artworks in churches are doing relatively well. Now, talking about my own museum in Berlin, before I went to the Yale University National Gallery, that is a Mies van der Rohe building, 
very good for in terms of architecture, I would say, but a nightmare for building physics because it's just steel and glass, no sorption properties, and you can see fluctuations between 26 and 55. Um, and in winter, when we have very low outside temperatures, while the water is condensing on the inside of the windows, it's freezing, you get some kind of an indoor fountain, you can imagine you don't really have 50% flat in that building. Um, crossing the Atlantic Ocean to the ELP Body Museum, the Great Hall, the famous 16th Chapel of the Paleontology with the Brontosaurus, with the Salinger murals. Um, that is the relative humidity and temperature in the Peabody Museum Great Hall between 10% RH and 85 well, and also our new environmental science center, you can still see climatized, heavily climatized, but way out of that corridor, which, you know, we think should be a safe zone, 40 to 60. And, and that is the reality, since I was given only 10 minutes, I don't show you the Louvre, I don't show you the Uffizi, I don't show you the Victoria and Albert Museum, but I have data from all these locations, and I can tell you that there is no museum which has 50% flat RH. Why? Well, because museums have visitors, and um, in terms of preservation, it would be much better if museums wouldn't have visitors, because you would not have to open the door in the morning and to close it in the evening. Visitors, I mean, are the life of the museums, but they are also the threat to stable thermal conditions. Well, but the acceptance of a less strict climate control is slowly growing. So the joint IIC-ICOM-CC declaration uh, of environmental guidelines in 2014 uh, you know, is actually calling for care of collections should be achieved in a way that does not assume air conditioning as a precondition. Because also, and we're now getting into this field of sustainability, a study which was carried out at the Smithsonian, a master thesis, a thesis at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia by David Artigas a few years ago, revealed that if you allow a higher variance in relative humidity and temperature in your objects, your energy consumption goes down exponentially. Which means also the, the more you want to go to 50% flat or age, your energy consumption will go up exponentially and your energy bill as well. This is an example at Yale. Uh, I mean, don't look at all these columns, but we, actually, the Yale University Art Gallery, you can see, is the third column from the right. So museums are quite often um, the highest energy users in the university context and also in other contexts, like um, the Met School, you know, it's not much, the Environmental Science Center, the High Performance Computing Center, they all use energy, but the museums use a lot of uh, energy if, it, if, if you relate this to the square footage or the cubic foot. Where are we compared to other institutions? Uh, well, you can see, just look at these two columns on the right. It's a short view to, the, to our friends in Scandinavia. Um, you can see our gallery with like more than 100 kilowatt hours per cubic meter and year and the typical museum in Denmark down to 23, 24, and uh, in our world, famous passive storage in Vele for the National Museum of Denmark. You can't even see it. It's like, it's a hundred times less than our situation in, at Yale. And so why is this like this? Why is the museum storage in Vele so, so energy efficient? Well, first of all, it has a very, very low air exchange rate just 0 0.04 per hour, just through the inflation. Secondly, the temperature is quite low, 7 to 16 degrees, which makes the object lifetime much longer comparing to the typical museum requirement of 2015. So the conclusions, strict climate control in most cases brings little benefit at high cost. There are much higher risks in the museum context Stefan Michalski has shown this very clearly, a risk of fire, risk of vandalism, you know, of, of accidents is, is higher than the risk induced by thermal and humidity fluctuation. 
Most observations and most research, recent research also carried out at Yale University shows that variation plus minus 15% are safe. I'm not saying that there are objects which need to be 50 flat. There are, but most objects are safe in this boundary of 15% plus minus. And we know very well how to build energy efficient buildings. So if preservation is a priority, not human comfort, we can actually build almost zero energy storage for our museums. We don't do that but we may be forced to do that because we will not be able to pay our bills in the near future. So simple measures, and I will finish with this, simple measures, reducing ventilation, preferably ventilation controlled by CO2 measurements in the museum. So when you see that the CO2 level goes too, up, too much up, that you then include external air, apply heat and energy recovery, and define zones of different climate requirements where possible relax temperature and RH control and implement seasonal and daily set points for temperature and RH. Well, when I was saying that the usages are the problem in the museums uh, because they come in the morning and they leave in the evening, um, I don't want to leave here without saying that, of course, go as often as possible in a museum. That is from the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. And I thank you very much for your attention. Merci beaucoup Stéphane. Bien sûr, les visiteurs sont, sont la chance et la raison d'être des, des musées. Euh, je vous remercie pour cette, euh, cette présentation qui nous montre que grâce à la science, euh, nous pouvons finalement considérer que euh, des moyens simples, euh, moins coûteux, euh, plus écologiques pourraient être, euh, être mis en œuvre euh, au sein de, de, de nos pratiques de conservation. Euh, J'aimerais maintenant donner la parole à Madame Marthe Borot, euh, qui est responsable de, des questions d'environnement, de climat et d'énergie au sein de la direction de, du patrimoine culturel de Norvège. Euh, Marthe, vous allez euh, nous parler un petit peu dans la lignée de ce que vient de, de nous dire Stéphane, euh, de, de travaux de, de recherche et d'enquête qui sont réalisés dans votre pays et qui nous enseignent que finalement, euh, parfois, ça a été évoqué d'ailleurs pour l'agriculture par M. Martin Frick en ouverture, parfois euh, le passé, le patrimoine eux-mêmes recèle euh, des solutions euh, pour leur propre protection. Merci Marc. Thank you. I am to talk about how cultural heritage can contribute to climate mitigation. Uh, I will uh, uh, mention some important topics. That would be the sustainable. It's, it is sustainable to make use of already existing resources. The physical principles of all buildings can provide useful knowledge, and we need a holistic view on the total climate emissions. I will illustrate these topics by some examples, examples of projects on how we are working. One of the big, uh, one of the big um, challenges is the demand on tearing down old historic buildings to put up more energy efficient buildings, and uh, people saying that this is more environment friendly. Some years ago, in 2011, we commissioned a comparison of greenhouse gas emission from an old traditional log house compared with a new low energy house. We asked ourselves which house is the most environment friendly. Today there is a big focus on energy in the operational phase. We wanted to calculate to what extent construction uh, makes it an impact on the and how the important is it and how important is it to that existing houses are already built. We asked an interdisciplinary group of consultants to make such comparison. The old house is already built. The impact of, the building, of building the house has been taken long time ago. It is not very energy efficient, but it can be made much more efficient. The new house is much more energy efficient, but it has to be built. Emissions from production of materials will be much higher. The factors that we considered, it was emissions from energy use in the operational phase and emissions from the production of building materials. And we looked at the lifespan of 60 years from now 
And as energy source, we, we looked at average uh, emissions in EU. And the results you can see here. Um, the materials is blue and energy use in the operational phase is shown as, as red. To the left, the old house before upgrading and in the middle, the old house after upgrading and also including change of energy source. And to the right, the new house. Uh, this shows that the old house competes strongly with the new. The load from the construction of the new house is so big that it has a lot to say for the results. The results show us that existing houses can be more environment friendly than new, very energy efficient buildings, but it is important to use environment friendly materials uh, and environment friendly energy source. An almost similar comparison of greenhouse gas emissions, but this time as a new, on a new log building and a passive house. The background for this was a suggestion this spring for the, from the authorities in Norway that this kind of walls would require additional isolation. And we need craftsmen who can restore these type of buildings, which we have very many of. To become a good restor restoration craftsman, you must have experience in building new log buildings. The people ordering these houses today, they want to have these timber walls visible. So we fed fewer craftsmen. In addition, this is a thousand year old tradition that we do not want to, to lose. The result is that the timber log house is slightly better than the passive house. The emissions from the materials of the log house are the half of the emissions from the materials in the passive house. The emissions from mat materials are lower than the emissions from the use of energy. It is therefore important to use renewable en energy. Um, and it should be, we, we advocates, that it should be ac accepted to compensate for increased energy demand with locally produced environment friendly energy. This is important for cultural heritage buildings. And it is important to consider greenhouse gas emission from the whole lifespan. And the proposal to prohib prohibit such walls is withdrawn. There are similar comparisons with um, similar results are made from um, other um, uh, countries too, for instance in the USA on different building types, more modern building types and bigger big buildings too. In Norway, we have examples of office buildings from the 50s and 60s with culture values, which have been or can be upgraded to very energy efficient modern buildings with a lower greenhouse gas emission than new buildings. In Oslo, we had a terrorist attack on the government building in 2011. Many people died here and in a political yacht camp as a right-wing extremist attack. I'm using this building as an example on how we work. We had subsequently big discussions on demolition or uh, remediation. The government building was injured, we lost the interiors, but the main structures was unharmed. The building represents the modern Norwegian welfare state and it has high culture heritage values. The building has even gained more symbolic significance in that it was, stand, had, was standing after the bomb attack. Um, <clears throat> the government in, initiated an analysis that showed that this building would be far less environment friendly than a new building replacing it. The main criticism was that the building would be expensive to operate and that it would be far less climate friendly than a new building if not upgraded to a passive house level. And that was not possible. We showed by using consultants, engineers and architects that the house could have modern promises, it would uh, not be more expensive to keep, would be safe and could have sufficient indoor climate, even though it has low floor height and challenges when it comes to ventilation and other infrastructures. And it could be renovated to a passive house without losing the cultural heritage volumes. This became an important report which removed the main arguments for demolition 
and it is now decided that the building shall be preserved. <clears throat> we have a similar building listed through the Cultural Heritage Act, upgraded just like this, with, uh, also with a uh, valuable interior preserved. A few words about a European standard that we are making. Its name is Guidelines for Improving Energy Performance of Historic Buildings. The standard has recently been on a hearing and we hope that it will be completed in about a year. It uh, presents a normative working procedure for planning and selection of measures while preserving the heritage values. It's not limited to building with statutory protection. Uh, it is based on an in-depth investigation and documentation of the building and its procedures to assess the impact of those measures taking into account risks and consequences of energy-related interventions. And we hope when it's uh, completed that it will be used by culture authorities to make valuable historic buildings energy efficient and still keep their values. <clears throat> In conclusion, an example of an old Norwegian barn becoming an eco-friendly eco landmark and giving added value to an old historic center a religious, political, and cultural center from the Middle Age. It's a red barn from the late 19th century, a common historic building in Norway, but a building type that is losing its functions. A lot of these kind of buildings are being demolished each year. One of few buildings, and at this site, this is one of few buildings that could be changed in, in this valuable historic environment. And this is not a project that we would normally have engaged in. Um, it is a project to revitalize this historic center, uh, and it will show how we can use an old barn and reuse it. But the most important is that we, can, we want to show the parallel between traditional building technology and modern climate-friendly construction. The building is environmentally uh, sewn from cradle to cradle. <clears throat> Use of an existing building is a climate-friendly uh, solution, as we have shown before. Parts of this building has been demolished and rebuilt, but in an environmentally friendly way. As for all traditional buildings, these new uh, parts use locally produced, little processed, environment-friendly materials with long life. It has he healthy indoor climate, diffusion and moisture regulation materials, simple systems for ventilation, heat recovery, etc. It local uses local renewable energy sources, and it has low greenhouse gas emissions during construction and in operation. This building will be a landmark, an old house pointing towards the future. And this unites heritage conservation and ecological construction methods. So when building new, we can learn from the old. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Marc. Je vais demander à Monsieur Jerry Velasquez euh, de nous proposer quelques remarques conclusives avant d'engager de, la, la discussion avec, euh, avec la salle. Thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I think that um, there's a lot of uh, very interesting discussion that has been made today, but I take a few of them uh, and I highlight uh, some of them. Um, um, we have our colleague, uh, Mr. Cordell from the U.S., who actually, it stuck to my mind. He, he said that uh, we should have done these things before the disaster. There's a lot of stuff that we've learned from the crisis, a lot of these guidelines, a lot of the institutional setup and mechanism, the, the, the way to assess, uh, which uh, he was able to, to actually develop in a few days. But it would have been far, far better if it was done ahead of time. Now, the question is that, uh, this kind of learning, the use of this learning is not them already, it's for you. The question is, would you like to learn from a crisis 
by experiencing the crisis or would you like to learn from a crisis from his crisis? Because, uh, you know, learning from crisis is not just the one that you experience. And he's speaking from experience. And I think that we should take from this very good learning experience and maybe, you know, pick up from the, the good um, message that he has. We should have done this before. It would have been better if it was done before. And he has given us a few very concrete examples of what that is. Which leads me to the second point, and it was highlighted by Rohit here and a few others, and this is institutional coordination. We've always thought institutional coordination is global, but in reality, it is local. It's like a date. You're in a dance floor. It's a blind date. Who makes the first move? Are you going to wait for people on the disasters or climate side to come to you and ask for your hand to dance, or will you be the one who will reach out? And we've seen all of these examples that they are the ones who are actually doing the first move because they believe that they are part of development, that they have a contribution to make. And I think it's very important because I think we are here not to solve the problem of climate. We're not here. We're not going to be solved with climate change. We're not going to be solving development. We're here to protect cultural heritage and to make sure that it is in fact not invisible and appreciated. And to do that, we are part of development, which brings me to the third point which is a very important aspect highlighted by all the speakers. We've always said that we have to include heritage aspects in development, in climate change, and in disastrous reduction. But all of them gave us a very important message. It is not just conservation that we need to insert. It is, in fact, the contribution of heritage. It has a, possible, it is, it has a positive contribution to reducing climate change. The Green, build, the green Museum it is not just going to serve, conserve energy. It is providing a very strong message that even museums can combat climate change, like everybody else. So it has a very strong positive message. So a green museum is not just conserving a few dollars and cents. It is also making a message that we can be a part of combating climate change. And um, I, I always like the story of Philadelphia, the first city in the United States that has now been uh, World Heritage City, you know, uh, assigned two weeks ago, because Philadelphia have used um, heritage and history to drive economic growth. They have been threatened of the closure of the Navy Yard, and they will be losing jobs. They will be losing billions of dollars, but they've used the, the revitalization of the Navy Yard to, in fact, uh, deliver growth, economic growth, jobs. So, in fact, heritage and culture really can drive development. It is very good economic sense. So the question is that it is not just to protect them. It is, in fact, something that can contribute to the greater good. Now, the question is, can we be brave enough to, you know, be part of that process, or are we going to be in our own kind of shell? So the message is there. And the last message that I took from everybody is that awareness is key. Uh, what we knew before is not enough. The, the construction methods, the awareness of people is not enough. And the guidelines provided to us, example from the U.S., is a very typical example of what needs to be done for people. And so I think that they have very good examples from, 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 from everybody here. And I think that everybody can, because I've always asked when, when I was invited to, to come to this meeting, what is the outcome? And I think the outcome, the useful outcome, is that if one or two of you is inspired enough and you go back and you do something practical about it, I think that's a tangible outcome of the session. So maybe we inspired some of you, and maybe there's some kind of tangible outcome in one or two of you. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Jerry Velasquez. Uh, J'aimerais à présent engager la discussion avec, uh, avec l'Assemblée Générale et les, les délégations et vous demander donc uh, si vous avez des questions euh, des remarques ou des, ou des commentaires euh, à apporter à ce qu'il vient d'être dit. Uh, Greece. Thank you very much. I found that not only very inspiring, very interesting, but also very encouraging. 
because there's always so much more to learn in such meetings. What I very simply would like to add is that some years ago in Greece, we organized through ICOMOS a very uh, interesting conference. Uh, it was on the management of archaeological heritage in times of economic crisis. Um, this is not because the this, uh, this crisis is um, uh, something which uh, has affected us because it affects the whole world. And um, either in mitigation, either in confrontation of, of uh, risk or disaster, you definitely need infrastructure, you need funds, at least some. So um, this conference was very interesting because people from, uh, we had above 40 speakers from very, um, various places of the world. We had UNESCO, ECOM, ECOMAS, ECROM there as well. And um, uh, it's very interesting because these people came up with their experience and their solutions. So um, I don't know whether it exists in the Crumb Library, but um, I would like to send it. And I think that it would uh, be good for people to, to look at at some time, because there you have a lot of solutions in regard to climate change or uh, other risks that can be confronted. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Uh, le, le Zimbabwe, s'il vous plaît. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to, uh, first of all, congratulate um, the, ent the entire organization of this meeting, which I think um, uh, uh, brings together some very, very essential um, areas of preservation and of conservation and, and even promotion at the same time of our cultural and natural heritage. I just w would like to also find out, well, and, and we d don't need a response immediately, to what extent ICROM can assist with the policy and legislative areas, because it seems to me with all the good intention, if a place that needs to be very clearly laid out is just what policies they are concerning the conservation in this case of, of natural and cultural heritage, but also the legislation. And that kind of assistance, technical assistance, would be absolutely important, particularly to assist countries. Where, and and that, that may not be as costly as, you know, many airfares if some policy work is done. And then assist and share information for countries to be able to, to adapt legislation in the form of acts. Um, to, to enforce some of the decisions that, uh, that are critical. So that's really my contribution, but also to say that uh, we do look forward. I do want to support um, uh, my fellow African um, uh, members here who have made comments and expressed a sentiment which we would like to, we hope we can get some additional assistance, particularly in the African context. We have a, a, a lot of fast uh, uh, a lot of areas that are being fast lost in the country, in, the, in our various countries, and we'd be very appreciative for just a little more attention to be given to our countries. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Le Sénégal. Merci de m'avoir donné la parole. Je parle pour moi au nom du Sénégal. Je félicite beaucoup les panélistes qui m'ont beaucoup appris beaucoup de choses. Cependant, nous avons des problèmes, nous. C'est le problème qui a été évoqué hier par notre ami du Burkina. Nous sommes un peu laissés en rade, pensez à nous. Le Sénégal a 200 km de côte qui subit une catastrophe par l'érosion. Il y a beaucoup d'inondations. Et c'est le même cas des autres pays qui sont limitrophes. Nous demandons à ce que ICROM pense à l'Afrique et à l'Afrique occidentale. Les solutions dont vous avez fait montre aujourd'hui, nous ne les avons pas. Et nous suivons beaucoup d'agressions écologiques. Il est temps, c'est une sonnette d'alarme, 
pour tout le pays, parce que si nous sauvons l'Afrique, nous sauvons aussi le monde. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup. La... Haïti a, ré... a demandé la parole. Merci. Donc, comme d'habitude, nous, nous venons d'apprendre si beaucoup de choses et à partir de ces excellentes présentations. Donc, il y a plusieurs remarques et dans le cas d'Haïti à faire, puisque nous venons en Haïti de subir le séisme du 12 janvier 2010, donc qui a causé pas moins de 300 000 morts, dont moi j'en suis une victime. Donc, comme je le disais hier, donc, Haïti est très menacé par les catastrophes naturelles. Cependant, à partir de ces différentes présentations, je peux comprendre qu'il y a des paradigmes, qu'il y a des modèles, qu'il y a des solutions. Et parmi ces solutions, ou parmi les changements de paradigme qu'il faut y avoir, il y a par exemple cette question de considérer la culture comme un élément transversal. Souvent dans les forums internationaux, souvent dans les débats, eh bien on avance, et dans les politiques nationales également, que la culture c'est un élément transversal. Alors que il paraît de plus en plus que la culture doit être considérée comme un élément à part entière, mais à travers les politiques publiques, à travers les politiques générales des gouvernements. Parce que plus on considère la culture comme un élément transversal, plus on la néglige. Alors que si c'est l'inverse, on va avoir une priorité axée sur la culture, donc sur la question patrimoniale. Donc, les politiques publiques ici, dans ce sens, également doivent être beaucoup plus proactives, volontaristes, mais également et de façon, je dirais, cohérente. Et c'est pour cela donc, il y a plusieurs intervenants qui ont montré la nécessité de la synergie et la coordination entre les différents éléments, le ministère de l'Environnement, le ministère de l'Éducation, le ministère de la Culture, etc. Donc, comment créer cette coordination, cette synergie Pour moi, c'est l'un des axes importants en termes de leçons, si vous voulez, qui, qui, qui est dégagé dans, à travers ces différentes présentations. Et de là, par exemple, souvent on parle de programmes d'éducation culturelle et artistique. En Haïti, nous avons également des tentatives de programmes d'éducation culturelle et artistique. Alors que de plus en plus, maintenant, il faut mettre l'emphase sur l'éducation de l'environnement en relation avec la culture également. Donc, on peut toujours avoir des programmes d'éducation culturelle et artistique, mais pas seulement. Parce que ici, il est important, en fait, encore une fois, il y a un intervenant qui l'a souligné, je crois que c'est M. Gigassiou qui l'a souligné, je ne sais pas si j'ai bien prononcé le nom, et l'important de l'information, mais l'important de l'éducation sur l'environnement en, ré, en relation, en interaction avec la culture. Donc, c'est pour donner un exemple. Donc, il y a un autre aspect important pour moi, c'est les savoir-faire locaux, les savoir-faire traditionnels, les savoirs et les savoir-faire traditionnels. Cette question a été soulevée hier également lors des débats et je voulais plus ou moins intervenir là-dessus, mais de façon très, très brève. Et quand je regardais la présentation de, 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 de Mme Matbolo, donc je, 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 si vous voulez, je vu que en Norvège, il y a des modèles de maisons pareils, si vous voulez, dans les zones côtières en Haïti, mais pas avec les, matériaux de, les mêmes matériaux. Donc, dans les zones côtières, par exemple, dans, dans tout le sud-est en Haïti, vous allez trouver des, des maisons pareilles, avec le même style architectural, mais en bois. Mais ce sont des maisons souvent considérées comme des maisons des pauvres. Ce ne sont pas des maisons qui rentrent dans la logique de l'urbanisation. Alors, ce que ces maisons-là répondent, à une, donnent une réponse à l'environnement, à la problématique environnementale, face, si vous voulez, à la mer. Donc, autrement dit, donc, il y a une importance, à mon avis, de considérer, en même temps qu'on cherche, si vous voulez, à moderniser, mais en même temps, il faut considérer les savoir-faire traditionnels, 
puisque au niveau de, des populations locales, il y a des réponses tantôt. Mais ces réponses sont négligées ou ne sont pas valorisées. Et, et un autre aspect pour terminer, pour nous, la délégation d'Haïti ici, le grand défi, le grand problème, ce n'est pas surtout les catastrophes naturelles, ce sont les catastrophes sociales. Puisque en réalité, et nous, avons, nous avons, si vous voulez, expérimenté en Haïti ce modèle, ce postulat. Il y a un séisme qui s'est passé en Haïti de 5.1 et qui a causé beaucoup de dégâts, d'énormes dégâts. Et en, au Chili, on a eu justement des séismes de 8 points épiques avec moins de dégâts. L'exemple haïtien montre que, entre autres, que la magnitude justement des séismes, ce n'est pas celle qui est la plus importante, c'est la magnitude justement, la magnitude des catastrophes sociales, c'est-à-dire nos comportements, comment est-ce que nous agissons nos actions, les actions politiques, les actions des différentes catégories d'acteurs, les actions du marché, les externalités justement des politiques d'industrialisation, dans le nord comme dans le sud. Donc c'est ce la magnitude justement sociale qui est la plus élevée. En fait, les économètres de l'environnement peuvent même construire des modèles à partir, si vous voulez, de, de, de cet élément-là. C'est-à-dire plus justement la magnitude nos actions sur l'environnement, sur justement la culture, sont élevées, plus le sera également, ou bien le seront également les catastrophes naturelles. Donc, et, et c'est en fonction de tout cela que je pense que la mise en place des politiques publiques axées sur à la fois l'environnement, l'éducation de l'environnement, l'éducation culturelle, dans un cadre synergique, donc, est fondamentale pour la suivi et de l'humanité. Pas, je ne parle pas seulement de la suivi d'Haïti, puisque l'humanité est une, donc il n'y a pas plusieurs. Donc, pour terminer, donc, il y a un, un élément important que je voudrais attirer l'attention de, de, si de l'Auguste de l'Assemblée. J'aime toujours expliquer à mes étudiants dans les cours et, et à l'Université d'État d'Haïti, l'histoire de l'humanité nous montre qu'il y a des civilisations entières qui sont disparues. Non pas par la guerre, mais surtout par des catastrophes naturelles. En Haïti, nous avons un exemple. La première ville, la première ville historique d'Haïti, la première ville coloniale, qui s'appelle Puerto Real, dans le nord d'Haïti, c'est une ville qui est totalement ensevelie. Donc, ceci dit, et le défi, c'est que face à nos enfants, on a tendance à vieillir par rapport au, à leur comportement, le, monde, le, le nombre de stress qu'ils nous créent, mais également nous faisons vieillir la terre et l'humanité. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Euh, J'ai des demandes d'intervention de, de, de la Norvège, de l'Iran et du Mexique. Euh, je vais vous remercier d'être bref dans vos contributions euh, au débat. Euh, et je devrais m'arrêter là pour les pour les participations des, des, des États membres à notre, à notre débat. La Norvège. Thank you, panel, for all your presentations. Uh, they've given us food for thought. Thank you too to ICROM and especially the Council with uh, Gunilla Langlisha doing a lot of work to prepare this General Assembly. Uh, the emissions from our combined airfares to bring us here to Rome have been considerable, but we have used the opportunity of being here to give ourselves intellectual input and uh, new inspiration. So we really hope that this format of having a thematic General Assembly will be continued, and what we've seen is just a beginning of many useful discussions. Thank you again. Merci beaucoup, l'Iran. I would like to thanks for excellent presentation, very fruitful about climate change and cultural heritage management. This issue is very important for us because Iran also has problem about the rice season and we are facing to learn 
subsidence near the some cultural heritage, and we try to coordinate between different organizations for managing special water management. But uh, this is a crisis, a crisis that needs more cooperation and exchange experiences. Of course, we have done some uh, investigation and arranging different meetings with experts, but not enough. Uh, we are eager and ready to extend this investigation and revise and accomplish management plan for uh, a cultural heritage. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Mexique. Merci. Uh, merci. I would like to um, thank all the very excellent presentations that were made this morning. And I believe that uh, in front of the many crises that most of our countries are suffering from climate change and a number of uh, different natural disasters and conflict, uh, there have been many uh, tools and methodologies that have already been developed, as we saw in some of the presentations this morning, uh, some of which are available online. And I believe it would be extremely interesting if Vikram could actually uh, dedicate a part in its website to collect many of these tools that are already uh, available in digital format so that everyone can benefit from them. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Euh, je, tiens, je tiens à vous remercier tous pour votre intérêt pour cette session thématique et pour les quelques remarques euh, euh, qui enrichissent encore euh, la présentation qui nous a été faite par les différents intervenants de ce matin. Euh, je tiens à remercier M. Jerry Velasquez euh, des conclusions euh, extrêmement fortes qu'il a tirées de l'ensemble de cette, de cette session thématique et de ce qui y a été dit. Euh, très certainement, euh, cette question va être, doit être au centre de euh, l'intérêt euh, et, du, et, du, et du travail conduit euh, par l'ICROM pour euh, les prochaines années. Je tiens enfin à remercier le groupe de travail qui a, qui a œuvré euh, à la préparation de cette session thématique et je donne la parole à l'un de ses membres, Eglal El Malik. Thank you so much. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my pleasure and honor to participate in the working group and to thank uh, in particular uh, Gunella for her work and also to thank uh, our speakers for today for their and to compliment their excellent uh, presentations um, and also to apologize for not being able to have uh, an expert from uh, Africa who could have told us better about the situation of uh, or the impact of the climatic change in Africa uh, so that I I feel it's my duty to say some words of an uh, example of the um, climatic change impact in Sudan, for instance. Uh, in Sudan, temperature is rising increasingly, and the rainfall is decreasing, so we have drought. And I would like to remind you with the 1980s drought in Africa, when all the world come together for Africa, uh, hopefully, world will come together for together for the cultural heritage of the world. Um, as you might know, that most of our uh, cultural heritage located in Sudan, in the northern part of Sudan, uh, it's an arid area, um, uh, and uh, yeah, the summer temperature can often exceed 43 centigrade. And uh, sometimes uh, 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 the wind yeah, they blow from, uh, from the desert, with, which uh, holds sands. And uh, this affects the, the uh, sand, the Nubian sandstone, which is uh, characterized of its uh, um, poor quality. 
and uh, this dry wind uh, now yani we we have a very uh, crucial situation in one of the World Heritage uh, Sites in Sudan, which is the uh, Merwetic Pyramids in, in Bijrawiya. It's uh, the biggest concentration pyramids in the world. And this, uh, this uh, threat, which we think it's going to increase in the future of the storm, uh, that will uh, threaten losing the inscription of these uh, pyramids. Also, we have also a very uh, um, particular phenomenon nowadays that uh, in part of uh, West Sudan, in Darfur and, and uh, Kordofan, we started to have uh, heavy rain, which uh, led to the, uh, let me see this, uh, Recently, the increase of rains uh, in the northern Darfur and, and Kurdufan, west of Sudan, lead to the uh, increase of the recharge of the water table in the aquifer in the northern Sudan. This led to the uh, raise of humidity uh, in the foundation of Kerma site, which is also a site in the tentative list of Sudan for the World, Her World Heritage. And uh, the, um, all of it, it's built of uh, dry, dry uh, uh, brick, uh, sun dry brick. Uh, so uh, I think, I think, um, yani we have in Africa a different kind of of disaster, which could be a flood sometimes and drought sometimes. And this needs, of course, the collaboration of uh, our our um, our counterpart in uh, all the on all the world. So let us hope that uh, ECROM and let us support ECROM program for the risk management. Uh, and thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci encore à tous. Bravo à nos intervenants. Je vous invite maintenant à, participer, à profiter d'une pause café à saveur équitable qui nous est offerte par l'ICROM au rez-de-chaussée, une pause café à saveur équitable. Et je vous demande d'être de retour à 12h25 pour la reprise de nos débats avec vos déclarations. Merci. The next session is Item number 21, which is the statement of delegates and observers. I have a list that has been provided to me of those that um, have requested to make a statement. I would ask, I will, uh, if I have the country, I will note it. If I have the institution, I will. However, I would ask that you introduce yourself by name for the record of decision so that it is recorded. Uh, the first one uh, from the Philippines, the National Commission for Culture and the Arts, please. Thank you, Madam Chairman, uh, Director General, distinguished guests, colleagues, and fellow partners in the conservation of heritage and patrimony in a time of climate change and human conflict. On behalf of the delegates from the Philippines, through our ambassador, uh, Mr. Domingo Nolasco, and ICRAM Council member, Mr. Virgilio Reyes, greetings and uh, mabuhay. Please accept our government's commendation for the organization and the conduct of this 29th meeting and General Assembly, as well as for including and prioritizing as this year's thematic discussion on climate change and natural disasters vis-a-vis -vis the continued efforts on the preservation of our cultural heritage. On the first day of the session, my countryman, Mr. Velasquez, Jerry Velasquez, Director, Advocacy and Outreach of the UNISDR, discussed this in his introductory keynote address and in the session, it was rightfully stated that climate change will not come, it is already here. 
Therefore, it is incumbent on nations and peoples to be fully aware and be ready and prepared for all eventualities. We also anticipate uh, future assemblies um, or future meetings of the ICROM will have uh, thematic discussions. To date, after two years since we experienced almost simultaneously a devastating earthquake and a mega typhoon, in, we have moved in the affected areas in Cebu, Bohol, Leyte, and other islands in Central Philippines towards physical recovery and inventory of salvage materials of damaged cultural property. As you well know, there are almost 25 structures uh, and cultural properties that were affected during the typhoon and the earthquake. Likewise, accomplished uh, rabbit assessments, and we have also formulated restoration master plans and carried on specific site plans. Restoration works have already been partially started, and we are already in the various primary stages of conservation in some instances. The National Commission for Culture and the Arts, which is the Philippines' de facto Department of Culture, to which I represent, is spearheaded the documentation and organization of various conferences, all geared towards designing and formulating a Philippine conservation protocol or charter, which would eventually be the basis for future conservation work in the country. In this regard, we received the immediate and highly valuable counsel and assistance of ICROM, of UNESCO and ECOMOS, in preparing a study on the question of eventually, of eventually restoring and rehabilitating built cultural heritage. Aside from the natural disasters, other challenges being faced in the present are the so-called human-induced disasters. Despite the fact that in accordance with the Philippine Constitution, there was already a law passed in 2009 which mandates our state to protect, conserve, and restore cultural properties, currently there have been many recent destructive actions to national sites and monuments fueled by real estate speculation and severely affecting national patrimony. Foremost right now is a case being decided at the Supreme Court, that is, on whether a high-rise building constructed in the cultural and urban landscape of the monument in Manila to our national hero, Dr. Jose P. Rizal, violates heritage and zoning laws. ICOMOS, in its last General Assembly in Florence, also express its concern and solidarity with Filipinos on this question. We hope that the Philippine Supreme Court's decision will eventually have a positive impact on the preservation and maintenance of our cultural heritage sites. In this morning's thematic discussion panel and debate, ICROM Council member, former Ambassador Virgilio Reyes, has also done a capsule summary of the challenges faced by the Philippines in terms of climate change and natural disasters. Indeed, this will be a recurring theme in our country, which can be an example of how a developing country with relatively large population and limited resources, but with science, determination, and of course, deep passion could definitely face up to such challenges. So Madam Chair, thank you for this opportunity. Again, congratulations to the ICROM. Mabuhay and maraming salamat. Director General, Culture and Education for the European Commission. My name is Erminia Sciacchitano, European Commission Director General for Education and Culture. Uh, President, uh, Director General, and distinguished delegations and guests, 
The European Commission thanks ICROM for the invitation and its General Assembly as observer, giving us the opportunity to share with you latest development on cultural heritage policy, which is becoming a key area of European cultural policy. The political interest is testified by a long list of documents adopted in less than two years, including two country council conclusions, a commission communication, and a more recent resolution of the European Parliament adopted last September. It is an impressive list, considering that we have to go back to 1994 to find a former council conclusion on heritage, meaning 20 years. Responding to the call of the EU ministers for the development uh, for the strategic uh, approach of cultural heritage for Europe, the Commission adopted last year a communication towards an integrated approach to cultural heritage for Europe, highlighting the strong potential of heritage for the achievement of the EU objectives. In our communication, we describe the challenges faced by the heritage sector reduction of public budgets, environmental degradation, neglect, overexploitation, illicit trafficking, climate change, you know well all those challenges. But we also highlighted the main existing opportunities for member states and stakeholders at EU level. As already highlighted by the President of the Cultural Committee of the European Parliament, Honorable Mrs. Costa, in her introduction, introductory speech, Cultural heritage is eligible for significant EU funding in the current programming period, including for conservation, digitization, research and training in several EU programs and actions. I will give you some figures. Under the former cultural program, more than 130 cooperation projects in the area of cultural heritage received funding, totaling 38 million euros. Heritage is one of the most represented sectors among the projects selected so far in the Creative Europe program. We are also promoting high standards and high quality skills in conservation practice every year by awarding the European Union Prize for Cultural Heritage Europa Nostra Award. This year, 263 projects completed for the prize from 29 countries. This is the largest number of applications received in the prize history, showing the vitality of the sector. For 2016-17, there will be also a substantial increase in the investment in cultural heritage research and, and innovation from Horizon 2020, bringing it more to 100 million. Under all the three pillars of the program, excellent science, industrial leadership, and societal challenges. The Commission also provides us direct support to cultural heritage through the structural funds. And we are happy to announce that we estimate that 4.77 billion euro will be dedicated to the protection of cultural heritage in 2014-2020 in member states. A significant increase, significant increase compared to 3.2 billion in the previous programming period. In a few days, the, the Cultural Council will adopt its conclusion on culture in the EU external relations, and in particular, on the role that culture plays in development cooperation. The Commission has already started to reflect on how to best develop a more strategic approach towards the cultural dimension in EU external relations. The key challenge now is to take advantage of those opportunities at all levels. This is why in our communication we invited the Member States and the stakeholders, which include ICROM, to work more closely across borders, making the most of EU policies and programmes, and progress towards a more integrated approach at national at, and EU level. And the need for a more transversal approach has been just stressed in the previous debate on climate change. If we do not build bridges between tangible and intangible heritage and between heritage and the cultural and creative industries of a territory, if we do not establish more synergies between education, environment, research, territorial development, all the other policies concerned, in fact, the transmission of our cultural capital, that is our common wealth, and an irreplaceable repository of knowledge will become some impossible. In order to make the integrated approach work, we have just started working with the EU member states on developing innovative governance models, 
uh, where different administration, public and private actors, citizens, communities, stakeholders participate in the maintenance and management of cultural heritage. Let me stress that participatory approach is also a soft measure for risk prevention. There is a wealth of good practice across the EU from which we can learn. We are certain that the manual of good practice that the Member States experts will produce by the end of next year will be extremely useful. In 2016, we will carry on as well a study on the illicit trafficking in cultural objects with a focus on the import into the EU of cultural objects illegally exported from third countries and a study on risk assessment and prevention on the effects of cultural heritage on natural and man-made disasters. A second working group of member states will analyze heritage skills, training and knowledge transfer from 2017 on. Unfortunately, we cannot be fully satisfied for our achievements. As soon as we reach those important goals, we realize that heritage is, again, is under attack. Every piece of heritage which is destroyed, stolen, smuggled, illegally bought and sold is a piece of cultural identity lost to society. Every single illegal transaction robs future generations of their history. This is why the European Commission is fully committed to playing its part and that the EU is taking concrete actions to address the systematic looting of heritage sites in Syria and Iraq, a regulation banning imports of cultural goods from those two countries and providing additional funding to address the crisis. A couple of, year ago, of years ago, we used to say heritage is a crossroad. Now we think that the turning point is behind our shoulders. And ICROM, by promoting best practice among heritage and conservation professionals, by encouraging a wide understanding of the scope and value of cultural heritage, can play a key role in making this vision for heritage a reality. You are the one who can turn principle into action, nurture and enrich our expertise, our know-how, our common capital. And thanks to your work, the chain of knowledge and experience in heritage conservation and preservation will not be broken. Only in this way can heritage be a living force. Only in this way can heritage root us in our past. And only in this way can heritage shape our future. The Commission supports you and wishes you every success for the next program. Thank you. You need the Merci, Madame la Présidente. Euh, je, euh, voudrais, je suis Marina Schneider, je suis Senior Legal Officer euh, du Nidroit et je, suis, euh, je remplis également les fonctions de dépositaire de mon organisation. Euh, Permettez-moi de commencer en remerciant euh, l'ICROM pour l'invitation qui a été faite à Unidroit de participer en tant qu'observateur à cette euh, Assemblée Générale. Unidroit est ici, pour ceux qui ne le savent pas, Unidroit est une organisation intergouvernementale qui a son siège ici à Rome et dont euh, l'objectif est l'unification du droit privé. Nous avons, à la requête de l'UNESCO, adopté en 1995 une convention, enfin les États ont adopté, une convention sur les biens culturels volés ou illicitement exporté, qui vient compléter euh, la convention de l'UNESCO de 1970 et renforcer ses dispositions en matière de restitution. Nous l'avons entendu à plusieurs reprises depuis le début de cette Assemblée, euh, la protection du patrimoine et la lutte contre le trafic illicite est, est un engagement de chacun, selon sa propre expertise, mais les ponts sont nécessaires. C'est une mosaïque dont chaque pièce est importante, mais c'est le résultat qui se voit global. C'est pourquoi Unidroit a euh, décidé également de renforcer ses partenariats, d'établir des synergies et des stratégies. Dans ce cadre, nous avons en juin dernier signé avec l'ICROM un accord de coopération qui nous permettra de renforcer nos liens à plus forte raison, puisque nous sommes toutes les deux euh, établies à Rome. Mais c'est également 
Euh, le cas avec l'Union européenne, nous avons participé euh, euh, aux travaux préparatoires en vue de la euh, modification de la directive l'année dernière. Et c'est également le cas avec l'UNESCO, notamment depuis l'adoption de la résolution du Conseil de sécurité des Nations unies 2199, qui établit le lien entre euh, trafic des biens culturels et financement du terrorisme. Et euh, à la suite de cela, euh, l'UNESCO, Interpol et d'autres organisations, dont l'ICROM et Unidroit, ont été appelés à la mise en œuvre de cette résolution. Et c'est pourquoi euh, le secrétariat d'Unidroit a décidé avec l'UNESCO de renforcer cette, ce partenariat, euh, comment dirais-je, également physiquement. Je suis à Paris depuis cinq mois. Euh, détaché auprès du secrétariat de l'UNESCO et je le serai encore jusqu'à la fin de l'année pour euh, mieux travailler ensemble. Je rappellerai également, euh, la représentante du, euh, de l'Union européenne l'a dit, la résolution du Parlement européen en juin dernier sur la destruction du patrimoine qui rappelle très clairement que les conventions de 1970 et de 1995 sont les outils essentiels dans cette lutte et appelle tous les États à euh, la ratification. Alors, Unidroit euh, n'est pas opérationnel euh, sur ce plan, je dirais. Nous travaillons bien évidemment plus sur le plan institutionnel, juridique. Nous aidons les États à renforcer leur arsenal juridique. Et pour cela, nous participons aux formations euh, de l'UNESCO et nous espérons euh, renforcer cela avec l'ICROM également euh, à l'avenir. Nous avons un programme de bourse de recherche pour des juristes, ici à Rome. 2015 a été l'occasion pour Unidroit de fêter les 20 ans de sa convention. On a dit ce matin qu'il valait mieux faire les choses avant. La convention d'Unidroit a été certes une avancée, elle a peut-être même été très en avance dans son temps. Euh, on voit notamment que la nouvelle directive de 2014 en Europe reprend des principes déjà adoptés il y a 20 ans dans la Convention du Nidroit. Cette célébration à laquelle l'ICROM a été très étroitement euh, associée, et je voudrais ici remercier son directeur, M. De Caro, et notamment euh, l'une de ses collaboratrices, euh, Maria Teresa Iacuinta, pour l'aide qui nous a été apportée pour cette grande manifestation qui a eu lieu au, au Capitole. Ce fut l'occasion de voir l'importance de la Convention, son influence également, au-delà du nombre d'États qui ratifient, et il y a un très grand nombre actuellement d'États qui, qui ont engagé la procédure, et nous attendons de façon imminente le dépôt de l'instrument de la Syrie. Je terminerai en disant que 2016 sera également une année très importante pour une droit dans ce domaine, puisque ce sera d'abord l'occasion d'un nouveau programme de travail triennal, et nous avons une proposition du euh, gouvernement mexicain, notamment, de travailler sur les aspects de droit, de droit privé des collections privées. Enfin, 2016 sera l'occasion pour Unidroit de fêter son 90e anniversaire. Je dis bien 90e. Nous sommes une organisation qui est née en 1926, lors de la dissolution de la Société des Nations. Nous avons donc euh, une expertise euh, très longue. Et 2016 sera l'occasion de célébrer ces 90 ans à travers plusieurs manifestations, ce qui sera euh, l'occasion pour nous de montrer notre engagement également pour lutter contre le trafic illicite de biens culturels, mais également dans les autres domaines de travail de mon organisation. Ce sera également l'occasion euh, d'accroître, je l'espère, notre collaboration avec l'ICROM. Je vous remercie. Thank you. ECCO. Um, yes, um, Madam President, Madam Chair, and Director General, distinguished guests. On behalf of ECHO, which is the European Confederation of Conservative Restorers Organizations, I would like to thank ICROM very much for the kind invitation to attend this ICROM GA. It has been extremely stimulating and interesting to see the diverse range of issues that affect cultural heritage and, more importantly, the, fees, the steps um, that ICROM takes at an international level to address these issues. My comments here today speak a little to collaboration and to contribution in kind. 
um, again, I said I speak for the European Confederation of Conservative Restorer Organisations. This is a network of national organisations which represent the profession of the Conservative Restorer within Europe, but we work to advocate for the proper care and preservation of cultural heritage in our own countries. We ECHO do this at a European level. As a result, we are very much welcome the formal support that ECHO has received through the signing of a Memorandum of Understanding with ICRAM earlier this March. This specifically aligns um, the work that we do with that of ICRAM in promoting conservation restoration in Europe. And this has already borne uh, fruition in that ECHO was invited as an expert group to the Council of Europe's meeting of Ministers of Heritage in Namur earlier this year where the strategic importance of cultural heritage was agreed and a declaration signed. And since that meeting, ECHO has been granted observer status at the plenary sessions of the Steering Committee on Landscape, Heritage and Culture. And we have recently submitted um, our, uh, an invited opinion on priorities for developing strategic heritage for cultural heritage. Such a strategy comes at a time of as we can hear, economic, social and even climatic change within Europe. The fiscal retraction affecting the field of cultural heritage in Europe has really directly been felt by those working in the area of conservation restoration. I can say that Europe has a long and a long history of training and education in conservation restoration and continues to produce highly trained and motivated conservative restorers. This was recently demonstrated at the IIC Student and Emerging Conservatives Restorers Conference that was held recently in Poland and which ECHO attended. However, for young conservative restorers to have viable careers at a time when many established conservative restorers are really struggling to survive, it is even more important that cultural heritage is properly resourced and its value to society as a driver of economic growth is really understood. We welcome the Commission's work in this area, the huge work that's been done, and certainly in the last two years, for that integrated approach. And we work very much um, with the Commission and offer whatever experience we can. We welcome this greatly. Um, Um, I would just also like to say that the capacity building that ICRAM shows and demonstrates with your amazing staff, we really hope that this gets embedded in a professional demographic across the countries and that this is supported through education and development. And one thing that we have in Europe is, and it's a very live issue for us, is qualification and equivalence recognition for our qualifications and training as this allows us within Europe to move freely and offer our services. Um, finally, I would just like to say that ECHO celebrates its 25th uh, anniversary next year. We are celebrating it with the German um, organization. And the theme of our meeting is Conservation Matters, the profession as a resource for cultural heritage. And we would very warmly invite ICRAM to attend and um, the Director General may consider coming to speak to us. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you for your invitation. Watch. Um, good morning. Um, thank you, Madam the President, Madam Chair, Chairperson, Mr. The Director General. Uh, my name is Claudio Cimino and I represent here uh, Watch, which is the World Association for the Protection of Tangible and Intangible Culture Heritage in Times of Armed Conflicts. And uh, our association has been created uh, 10 years ago with the purpose to support uh, in the implementation of the Hague Convention. Uh, Hague Convention, that is uh, the convention that uh, um, first was introduced, uh, specializing on the subject uh, at UNESCO, so in 1954. Um, as such, uh, the convention did not, uh, as we all know, find much uh, application until uh, very recently when the second protocol was introduced and, uh, and a, new, a new impulse was cre created on uh, this uh, specific issue to be addressed. Um, I am very, uh, first of all, I want to congratulate ICRAM for this uh, General Assembly that testifies once more the commitment of, 
of your interagency uh, into the implementation of its own statutory uh, policy. I noticed uh, that uh, there is a very cooperative approach and there is uh, really a, a partnership between the state parties, actually. The way the issues were addressed is very consistent and so it's really re refreshing. Um, and I, I don't finish to be surprised by how much uh, deliverables you can see from ICRAM uh, if consider the amount of people that are working there. I mean, they have such a limited uh, uh, number of uh, people working and they deliver continuously new courses, new activities that support countries and this is something really encouraging. As far as we are concerned, uh, we noticed though that uh, in this assembly uh, the role of NGOs and uh, specialized NGOs is not really very much tackled. Although there is a very big need for a cooperation from governments to receive cooperation from uh, associations and NGOs that specialize on the field. Normally NGOs enter into action only when uh, it's in extreme uh, necessity a case. Otherwise they are to sort of uh, be on the side waiting for an opportunity to be engaged. Um, I say this because uh, it's a recurrent, although in conventions it's very specifically addressed the issue. It, and there, it's called for NGOs to be and take a more stake in responsibility into addressing issues concerned with cultural heritage protection. So I would invite uh, to reconsider these also in your future agendas because it could be a sort of uh, intermediate role between uh, international interagency organizations and state parties uh, where there are less resources, less capacity to develop schemes so that the NGOs could have a role in helping implementing policies. And uh, as far as policy is concerned, I noticed during the assembly that uh, return back and back again the issue of Africa and African countries that were uh, claiming uh, less uh, involvement, uh, less capacity to be addressing their own problems in their own country. I would like to this, uh, to this respect to recall here and uh, to complement what uh, Erminia Shakitano said just a little ago about European facilities and instruments that within the European uh, programs there is this Horizon 2020 program that uh, is financing heavily uh, research programs that could be useful for you, especially into the direction of promoting resilience of cultural heritage in terms of uh, resilience to every kind of events, especially climate change and the derivative of climate change, so natural disasters and, and um, anthropogenic disasters uh, that are the most concerning. Uh, nevertheless, uh, out of 10 years of experience uh, working ha with, aside uh, with some of the state parties that are also present here, we did learn some lessons and one of the things, uh, the issues that was just recalled uh, today in the morning about the cooperation at the level of state, within the state parties, interagency cooperation. Um, Herb Stobel, in his risk preparedness uh, book that has been published by ICRAM, and this is a publication, I think, of 1989 or something like that, uh, recommended the state parties to make an inventory of what do they have already at home. Most of the times, things that are invented exist already. You have already in your storage departments that have uh, excellent specialists, but they do not dialogue, they do not interact with each other, they don't even know what they're doing. And, uh, and a, lot of, a lot of work can be done in, preventive, in setting preventive policy, only just uh, setting interagency agreements that make normal uh, cooperation set and uh, operative. Um, preventive measures uh, that, that were discussed here are possible only if there is such a cooperation. No government in the world can afford to deploy hundreds of thousands of people when there is a disaster occurring uh, unless you have uh, a civil society that is educated to, to perform that. I was to this extent impressed by the presentation of the Filipino ambassador who um, has pointed out the role of children and education in school. Well, I strongly believe that children 
today in school at 10 years. In 10 years will be adults and most likely some of them will be even uh, playing a role in their governments. So if we start from that, perhaps in 10 years from now, risk preparedness will be possible in most of the countries that are sitting here. Again, compliment to this assembly. It was very generous of you to invite us to attend it and really was uh, refreshing. Thank you. Thank you. Algeria. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Donc, au terme des travaux de cette Assemblée générale, je voudrais exprimer au nom de la délégation algérienne mes félicitations donc, à l'endroit du directeur général et de son équipe, du Conseil et des acteurs et partenaires qui ont contribué donc, à la réussite et au succès de cette rencontre, sans oublier de remercier le gouvernement italien et la FAO pour avoir abrité comme de tradition nos travaux. Je voudrais également féliciter les nouveaux élus au Conseil de l'ICROM euh, en leur souhaitant plein succès. On n'a pas encore la liste. J'ai déjà eu l'occasion à l'ouverture et pendant les travaux de donner un point de vue et des appréciations sur la conduite des programmes et des actions de l'ICROM. Je n'y reviendrai pas. Je voudrais seulement profiter de ce moment convivial donc de clôture de nos travaux après avoir écouté le panel de discussion thématique sur les changements climatiques et la culture, que je remercie vivement par la qualité de leur présentation et l'attention portée au risque des changements climatiques, pour euh, exprimer fortement un appel à l'ICROM, donc à l'instar de l'UNESCO, pour euh, renforcer son regard et son attention vers l'Afrique, où la vulnérabilité au phénomène climatique est la plus forte et où les besoins d'intervention sont les plus urgents et les plus pressants. Donc voilà ce que j'avais à vous dire. Merci encore une fois et longue vie à l'ICROM. Thank you, Belgium. Thank you, Mr. President, dear delegates, uh, dear observers. Belgium wishes to express a sincere congratulations for having built in a thematic topic dedicated to climate change within the General Assembly. A special and personal thanks goes to Gunilla for all the work done. The presentations and the discussions that we heard this morning really vitalize uh, and help us to orientate the strategic directions that the Council will work out. In fact, ICROM can play a more vital and strategic role in integrating the aspect of cultural heritage within the topic of climate change. We all heard this morning that this link really needs to be strengthened. On the other hand, ICROM should further seek to foster the alignment between ICROM activities and initiatives related to climate change, such as the ones that we have heard this morning. Finally, we took notice of the request of the General Director to reinforce the ICROM staff. We congratulate the countries that have already replied positively, like Japan and France. Belgium will discuss this in the near future, and we hope to be able to give you soon a positive reply. Thank you. United States of America. Uh, good afternoon, um, Madam President and distinguished members of um, the General Assembly. I make a statement on behalf of my colleague, Stefan Simon. He had to um, get an airplane to get home. So on behalf of uh, Yale University's Institute for the Preservation of Cultural Heritage, Stefan wishes to congratulate the Director General and his staff for their tireless and important work to globally advance the conservation of cultural heritage. He feels privileged to collaborate with ECROM in the urgent field of culture in crisis, as expressed in the London Declaration following the conference which um, Yale co-hosted with the Victorian Albert Museum in London and endorsed by UNESCO. 
In April of 2016, Yale President Peter Salovey will host on behalf and with the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon the UN Global Colloquium, the UN Global Colloquium for University Presidents. The colloquium is developed um, and devoted to the preservation of cultural heritage, and Yale is very happy that ECROM's Director General has accepted the invitation. ECROM has a powerful voice in the debate about culture in crisis, sustainable conservation, and training, and it is stepping up to its responsibilities. There is a need for scientific research, new technologies in conservation science, computing, engineering, and other fields. In these dramatic times, we are aware um, that we have a long way to go. And as delegates um, have said, we are in a struggle which will last for years. Stefan hopes that uh, we can be generous and creative in our support for our colleagues who defend cultural heritage in the first line, the true monument women and men. It is a privilege to partner with ECROM for this effect, and Stefan thanks you. Now, while I have the floor and the microphone, I just want to say on behalf of myself and my colleagues from the United States, we have appreciated the opportunity to play an important role in this thematic program of impacts of climate change on cultural heritage. And we look forward to continuing working with the ECROM initiatives to strengthen, as others have asked, to strengthen the availability of these educational training and research informations on the ECROM website and in all manner of ECROM's work. So thank you very much for a wonderful General Assembly. Thank you. Sweden. Thank you. Um, first, we would like to congratulate to the choice earlier of the ICROM Award to Dr. Weber Nodoro for his passionate work with Africa 2009. This reminds us once again of the important results of this program, a program that Sweden, among others, had the possibility to support. And secondly, we would also, like many others here, would like to underline the importance of having focus on the work with risk reduction and the challenges of climate change and its effects on our cultural heritage. Here, ICRAM has a most important role. These are global questions, and as such, they can also only be addressed in a global, truly global context as that of the ICRAM organization. On the national level in Sweden, we do today have an action plan concerning the climate change and its effects on the cultural heritage. And we also have a much more active work concerning the risk reduction. And, and I would personally say that one of the reasons for the growing awareness in Sweden concerning these questions is absolutely the opportunity that we have taken to send colleagues to participate in the ICROM courses within this field. So from a Swedish point of view, ICROM already makes a difference here. And ICROM fully using the possibilities of new techniques like the e-learning could reach even more of our colleagues. But of course, we can do much, much more together within the ICROM. And here, as an example, we are looking forward together in clarifying the cultural heritage perspective within the Sendai framework, a most essential work which uh, has been pointed out. One of the messages that we do take with us home from the presentations of today is one quite depressive, and that is that the cultural heritage is clearly a victim of the climate change. But also we have a most positive message, and that is that we are most certainly also part of the solution. And that, I find, is a very good for our self-esteem within the coming work within this field. Thank you. Thank you. China? Thank you, President. Uh, the human society has left various cultural legacies during a long history of development. Every country has its unique cultural heritage. They are not only the treasure of the country, but also the treasure of the whole world. Chinese government strongly oppose any, uh, all kinds of terrorism and condemn all kinds of behavior destroying the cultural heritage from terrorism and extreme organizations. We would like to work with international society to help stop 
uh, the illegal transporting and the trade of the cultural objects that may come from those areas. Chinese, chi Chinese cultural heritage also faces severe threat from climate change and natural disasters. For example, Sichuan Wenchuan, Sichuan Wenchuan earthquake in 2008 has damaged lots of previous uh, precious cultural relics. In these years, we have gained some experience in protecting and preserving them, and we have done a lot in management and monitoring of the immovable cultural heritage. We would like to work with ECROM to share our experience in these aspects. Chinese government has long-term friendship with ECROM. Under a framework agreement with, between State Administration of Cultural Heritage and ECROM, Every year, a donation of 40,000 U.S. dollars is used for Chinese government scholarship. And every year, State Administration of Cultural Heritage sponsors an ECROM workshop, which includes half Chinese participants and half international participants. In 2015, the theme of the workshop is REOG, and in 2016, the theme would be monitoring of cultural heritage sites. Here, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to thank all the ECROM colleagues and teachers for their hard work and sincere help. Thank you. Thank you, Brazil. Madam the President, Madam the Chairperson of the ECROM Council, dear Dr. Stefano De Caro, Director General of ECROM, ECROM staff members, distinguished delegates and observers. The Brazilian delegation would like to reiterate our interest in working more closely with ICROM, contributing to boost the LATAM program through the activities of the Centro Lucio Costa, a UNESCO Category 2 center based in Rio de Janeiro, and also through the programs that our universities are performing in collaboration with the CPLP, the community of Portuguese-speaking countries, such as the Luso-Brazilian Congress on Conservation and Restoration of Cultural Heritage, which has just happened in its third edition last week in Évora, and it's planned to happen again in Rio de Janeiro in 2017. Under the umbrella of this initially loser brazilian meeting, our perspectives are widening with the inclusion of the African Portuguese-speaking countries already represented by the participation of Mozambique in our meeting in Évora. The initial steps towards the inclusion of African countries are closely related to the meetings held during the last ICROM General Assembly two years ago with the incentive of the Embassy of Brazil in Rome. As a new initiatives in terms of science, technology, and innovation for the study and preservation of cultural heritage, by next December 2015, so in three weeks, the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Belo Horizonte will host the Iperion Cultural Heritage Brazil, which will then we will fund the Association of Research Laboratories devoted to the development of science, technology, and innovation to the study and preservation of cultural heritage, which will be directly associated to the Iperion cultural heritage in Europe. It's our understanding that ICROM is leading the move of this European endeavor towards a global network of research infrastructure for science, technology, and innovation in cultural heritage. And our initiative will be a step forward to combine with these new horizons. We are particular, gr particularly grateful to hear the statements by ICROM related to the institutional efforts to improve the interaction between regional associations. In this regard, the South American Arab Countries Summit, ASPA, a B-regional mechanism established 10 years ago for cooperation and political coordination, which gathers the 22 member states of the League of Arab States and the 12 countries in South America, could become the political umbrella for cooperation between ATAR and LATAM programs. The experience of ATAR ICROM is of particular importance to our regional programs and activities. The Brazilian delegation in the aftermath of the tragic man-made disaster which happened last November 5th, one of the Brazil's worst mining disasters in the state of Minas Gerais, we'd like to present to the General Assembly the first results of a first mission on, mission on site conducted as an emergency response specifically devoted to the diagnostic and rescue of the cultural heritage seriously affected by the disaster. 
SOS Heritage is the name of the operation, led by the State Prosecutor's Office of the State of Minas Gerais through its coordination for the protection of the cultural heritage, in collaboration with the professionals of SECOR, Center for Conservation and Restoration of Cultural Heritage of the Federal University of Minas Gerais. For the last 14 days, right after the notice of the tragedy, the team has combined actions in archives, inventories, on-site visits, and aerial surveys with photographic documentation with the support of the State Police and the Firefighters Corporation of the State of Minas Gerais. The results of this operation have produced a first diagnostic of the situation which has just been released in Brazil, and I do inform you here of the very first results. The regions of Bento Rodrigues, Santo Antonio, and the district of Barra Longa have been visited by the team. The diagnostic produced by the interinstitutional team indicate severe and tragic losses in the religious buildings of the 18th and 19th century. A 1712, a 1718 chapel has been completely destroyed. Altarpieces and sculptures have disappeared under the mud. Fortunately, a total of 260 objects have been rescued by the team, including sacred polychrome sculptures, bells, liturgic instruments and textiles. On behalf of our colleagues who remained in Minas Gerais and took part of the operation, may I present our most sincere thing, thanks to the RECRAM's office of the Director General, Stefano De Caro, which has promptly, 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 promptly responded to our request for help, immediately sending models for diagnostic, forms and spreadsheets, together with guidelines for emergency response in the event of disasters. Our colleagues have indeed made a very good use of the material. Thank you for your attention. Canada. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to join my colleagues in the, the thanks that are being extended to the ICROM Council for the organization of our uh, thematic discussion over the last uh, couple of days. I think this has been a, a useful addition to the, the General Assembly format, and I think it's given us all much to think about. But I think we can do more than think about it. Um, many of the, the issues that were raised by colleagues from around the world are issues that we also face in Canada. We perhaps face some climate change effects in Canada that are, are not so generally um, shared. For example, the, the melting of the ice in the north, which is having a devastating impact on archaeological resources. And what's become clear to me is that there, there is the opportunity for, for mutual action here. And so, um, in addition to the, the um, comments of my colleagues urging ICROM to take action on this, I would like to move a motion, which would be, whereas there is agreement in this General Assembly on the significance of climate change impacts and disasters, and whereas the protection of our cultural heritage truly cannot wait, and whereas the presentations of this morning pointed to several areas in which efforts might be directed. Therefore, this General Assembly directs the Council of ICROM take into consideration the comments of the member states with respect to climate change, disaster, and cultural heritage, and integrate this important topic into the strategic directions which are currently under development. Now, Madam Chair, I see that under Section uh, Rule 46 of the Rules of Procedure, I need to deliver a written copy of this, uh, this pr pr uh, resolution to the Director General so that it can be distributed before the vote takes place. Thank you. Spain. Thank you very much, Madam President. Congratulations for the success. So just uh, to let you know, over the last five years, Spain has approved 14 national plans on conservation of cultural heritage. Most of them are done in cooperation with international institutions. These plans are tools for handling priorities and budget. Regarding priorities, the first plan is related to emergency and risk management, in other words, natural disasters. In this context, different workshops publications and education programs have been carried out. 
Next year, 2016, a new international course on natural disaster will be held at the Spanish Cultural Heritage Institute. So we are ready to cooperate with other countries under similar guidelines and goals, as we are discussing here, and provide our facilities. In addition, the Spanish government will be really glad to include another topics or issues, such as preventive conservation or research in conservation or others, always connected with uh, ICRON activities, as uh, we are discussing in, 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 in this uh, event. Thank you very much. Thank you. Finland? Madam Chair, dear delegates, uh, uh, the Director General, um, on behalf of the delegation of Finland, I would also like to um, say a few words. First, we would like to again congratulate ICROM, its Council, the Director General and staff for their va very valuable work during the previous biennium. And this time also we would like to express our Special thanks to the working group and Gunilla in their work in organizing the thematic discussion. It has been very inspiring. It has also um, very successfully proved its importance and role as a part of the agenda of the ICROM General Assembly. And um, somehow together with the presentations on the daily work of ICRAM, we heard yesterday these two parts of the of the program or agenda, they enforced each other. And uh, both showing the challenges and, but I would say also the possibilities and tools in uh, preserving and saving cultural heritage. Um, the importance and need in dissemination, the information, that's, that's also vital. And we heard the statement of Mexico expressing that the online information on ICROM web pages of this subject uh, would be important and we really support that. that. As the need for information on cultural um, climate change and uh, natural disasters continues in the future. Somehow to conclude, uh, only, to, only to get together we can. Thank you. Thank you. Islamic Republic of Iran. Thank you, Madam President, distinguished delegations, dear colleagues, on behalf of the Islamic Republic of Iran, I would like to take this opportunity and extend our gratitude and appreciation to the Director General and all the staff of ICROM for their hard and constructive works they conduct and pursue for the cause of promotion presentation and conservation of cultural properties, especially for this fruitful uh, General Assembly. We are uh, particularly indebted to ICROM as Iran being among the earliest members of the international organization have enjoyed from a very close and fruitful cooperation with ICROM throughout last almost 40 years. During these years, we were able, with cooperation of ICROM and other relevant institutions such as uh, ICOMUS and UNESCO, to prepare and or organize a number of training and uh, research programs in Iran to the benefit of Iranians as well as the cultural heritage experts of our region. Uh, to name a few of can mention here, the first regional conference on uh, the conservation and restoration of cultural heritage in Central and Western Asia. The first regional training course on conservation and restoration of stone monuments. Several training courses on conservation of earthen heritage and international workshop on the recovery of BAM's cultural heritage. The Iranian Cultural Heritage, Handicraft and Tourism Organization is committed to pursue the same path in future. We stand ready whenever and whenever needed to collaborate, it, to collaborate financially, scientifically, and logistically with ICROM in planning and implementation of training and research programs. 
we are also prepared to allocate an old building within the historical fabric of Isfahan as a training venue and provide financial and technical assistance needed. And also we eager to link up at our center for covering programs in all region, especially for capacity building. We uh, sincerely hope that with closer collaboration between the countries of the region and ICROM, the rich heritage of these countries could better be presented and preserved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Greece. Thank you very much. Greece is in close collaboration with ICROM and has served on council for two terms in these recent years. They have been very fruitful years, and in the framework of this very close cooperation, we wish to organize in 2016 a seminar on reorg and risk management with the help of the wonderful and most competent experts of ICROM. We support the role of ICROM as a beacon of the highest standards in the world of conservation, restoration, and in general, preservation of tangible and intangible heritage. Above all, however, we believe that ICROM's role is of the highest importance in the area of ethics and professional morality. Greece wishes to continue working closely with ICROM, especially in the sector of fighting strongly against illicit trafficking of cultural goods. This year, Greece organized a very important international conference on the implementation of the Hague Convention and its second protocol which is, in these days, very timely in view of the terrible destructions which take place in regard to cultural monuments and treasures. UNESCO and ICOMOS actively participated, and the valuable conclusions of this conference are at the disposal of all. And in closing, we wish the best to all those who gallantly offer their services, at times even their lives, to culture and fight for its preservation, as in the case of our colleague, Dr. Assad, whom our ministry had supported with funding in the past for the very important heritage of Syria. Greece has been active in the working group for disaster risk, and we are very happy that the thematic discussion finally took place in this wonderful way. This is an initiative which we believe must continue with a different theme and for the next General Assembly we would propose the topic of the fight against illicit trafficking and ethics. Thank you very much and I also wish ECROM, as we say in Greece, always good sailing. Guatemala. Thank you, Madam President. Even the political situation of Guatemala, and on behalf of the Minister of Culture, I want to share her special interest in supporting our delegation to be here in this General Assembly. I also want to congratulate for the thematic discussion on climate change. Personally, I must thank, after all this last eight years, Council that has been a special adventure and, and a way of knowledge, staff and the Director General for all the work we have done. We look forward on having a regional course in Guatemala in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. The observer from Portugal. Thank you, Mrs. Chairman. Uh, I'm Isabel Rapos Magalhães. I was a former council member and am here as an independent observer, and for that I want to thank the Director General. I would like to compliment and thank ICROM for this so important uh, um, discussion this morning in a year particularly harsh for cultural heritage. If I have learned something in my years at ICROM, it's, it's that are some, such things as solidarity, international cooperation, people giving everything for cultural heritage, even their lives. 
Even at the aftermath of a big catastrophe, there are always so something positive. It was because of image of European cities destroyed by World War II that organizations like UNESCO, ICROM, Blue Shield, and the Hague Convention emerged. It was the images of Florence ravaged by the flood of 66 that an extraordinary international solidarity movement appeared and the image of the angels of the mud still move us. Portugal had its share of heritage catastrophe and when we did overcome them also relying on international cooperation. ICROM projects and programs are targeted to help cultural heritage conservation and recovery, promoting cooperation. So we applied to have a real course uh, in Lisbon and are doing everything we can to apply to, to have a first aid course in cultural heritage in time of crisis in Portugal. I think that an extraordinary moment was the Haiti earthquake there we saw an institution, the Smithsonian, take the task of coordination international organizations for a more efficient outcome. That, already, uh, that also was in ICOM. Uh, but such, uh, such as always, ICOM with assessment training was present and also the first F course with APARNA. So we saw the same pattern at Nepal, where Portuguese experts participated under ICORP ICOMOS. And we have seen catastrophes. As we have seen, catastrophes we always happen affecting cultural heritage. But life is not only to be afraid of the rain, but to learn how to dance in the rain. So the keynotes are disaster planning, mitigation, raising awareness, education and training, involve all stakeholders, but most of all, cooperation, solidarity, volunteers, the human factor, something we learn in here in ICROM. After the destruction of Palmyria, Syrian architects talked about rebuilding it. Even if it is impossible, it will always stay forever almost like an immaterial world heritage as it will never, never be forgotten. Image, memory are relevant factors in heritage. The project that UNESCO along with Oxford University is launching the million database in 3D to uh, document heritage at risk because of Daesh that will appeal to volunteers is a great example. Document heritage is fundamental for many reasons, but also because we must at least save the memory of it. And that's why ICROM SOIMA project is so important. It works for the future. And luckily, some Portuguese people uh, were present at the last uh, um, course. Thank you so much. Thank you. I now bring a close to the discussion and I will just turn it to our Director General for some uh, concluding remarks uh, or observations from this particular session. I have to thank, first of all, all the delegates who have expressed their appreciation for the work of the staff. They do a very important job. They are an excellent team, and I learn a lot of things from them, together with the, all our trainees. About, <laughs> there are many, mm, issues of uh, reflections and of, of comment, but I will be short because some of them I already addressed in my speech in the days before. Uh, I hope so much that the European Union can help us uh, in sharing uh, projects and in uh, addressing some of the major issues that we have discussed in these days. 
I hope that uh, European Union is a multi-partner, multinational organization. Then many of the delegates from European countries have a stake. European Union takes decision. And there is a decision that has to be taken so to involve ICROM not only in the discussion, but also in, the, uh, in, in carrying out in the implementation of the decisions. This uh, will give us uh, a major impact in some of the problems. I offered just one example of the regional programs where we need to work with a major, with a larger perspective. And uh, you know that this is Africa. Africa requests truly a big investment by every bilateral collaboration, but I think most by European Union. We are, uh, Europe and Africa are connected. The Mediterranean, according to Brodel, was just a little lake, a little marsh. <laughs> and uh, we have to face this uh, issue in, for the benefit of both. Uh, I, well, I welcome also the, I thank the Sweden, because the Sweden was a, a crucial, was a, a very important in the beginning of the Prema project. Uh, this was, these were the time of the uh, national approach. Europe w came after, but in the beginning it was a national of some few countries and some few organizations that gave the impulse of uh, uh, the African program. And I want to thank, and I hope that now in the framework European Union, we can work better together. I received a lot of, uh, I, I, I was also very, I, I catch, I, I caught a little word by m my colleagues of Iran uh, when they declared the, the, the wish to work with Atar. This will be very important. We, we all know that it's very, very important to reopen a collaboration between Iran and the Arab world. It's a collaboration that is based on the long common culture. In all Arab world, you can see Iranian artifacts. And I think that uh, we can reopen channels for cooperation, for peace, for dialogue, using these uh, new channels of the Atar-Iran collaboration. So we are absolutely ready. Uh, we have already uh, made some hypothesis with my colleague Zaki Aslan in order to achieve it. Soima. Thanks for having uh, remembered this uh, project. In fact, this is uh, one of the, of the most important, uh, even if it is not looking catastrophic, uh, because you are dealing with, uh, uh, with mi microfilms, uh, with uh, uh, drives, uh, with uh, quite intangible heritage. But the memory of the modern times is embedded in this, is embedded in the digital, is embedded in movies, and the history of the future will be written using these resources. And a lot of this memory is at risk now, even for the climate change, even because of the climate change. So uh, this is an important tool that developed countries have already started to, to address, but there is a lot of need in many other countries that needs to be addressed with the help of the community. Uh, not so many things to add. I repeat my, my, my thanks. That's all. Ikram is very grateful to all of you. Ah, just a thing. NGOs, watch. It's important. It's true. Because living heritage 
Heritage are monuments, but heritage are communities, and communities are represented by one side on the political organization, but the other sides, and we have seen how they are more effective in many cases, are local organizations, NGOs, orga associations, etc. We use them a lot of times, even if they have not big recognition flags and so on. But Aparna, uh, Joe, uh, Gamini, they are working a lot with them. And we thank them. And we probably have also to discuss in the future uh, in a more strategic way uh, how to deal, uh, which is the relationship, and how we can improve a little bit better our, our way of working with the, this, in, not informal, but more, uh, less political organization, I have to say. Thank you very much, and uh, probably Marie would, would say something. No. no. <laughs> Marie is hungry. <laughs> I am hungry. Wow. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, we will uh, deal with the motion that has been put on the floor by Canada after the lunch break. And we will get the results of the election of the new members of council at 2.45. 2.45.